Okay, so hello and welcome to the Medieval Academy of America webinar, The Mother of All Pandemics, The State of Black Death Research in the Age of COVID-19. We're bringing together, probably for the first time on a single digital stage, scholars working on plague in pre-modern China, Africa, Europe, and Western Asia. My name is Winston Black, and I have the pleasure and honor of serving as moderator for this webinar. I'm a historian of medicine, science, and education in medieval Europe, and the author of several books and articles on those subjects. Most recently, Medicine and Healing in the Pre-Modern West, and I'm currently completing a book titled The Black Death, Facts and Fictions for ABC Clio. I'm joined off scenes uh, by my co-moderator, Dr. Lori Jones of the University of Ottawa and Carleton University. She's a historian of medicine and an expert in medieval and early modern plague treatises. And she's probably best known for her work on detecting mislabeled plague images. Hmm. Also off scenes is our webinar bibliographer, Joros Rusin. He's a PhD candidate on the history of the Black Death at Utrecht University. So uh, thanks to both of you for your assistance. So before we move on to our main speakers, uh, we'll have a word from Lisa Fagan Davis, Executive Director of the Medieval Academy of America. Lisa? Thank you so much, Winston. And thank you all of you for being here. We have a wonderful turnout. We're just about at almost at 500. The numbers are going up all the time. I'm thrilled. Uh, this is an extraordinary, group that Monica Green has brought together um, to address us today on this extremely important and extremely timely topic. The Medieval Academy of America is the largest organization in the world devoted to supporting excellence in the field of medieval studies. And we are thrilled to be sponsoring this webinar. If you wanna learn more about who we are and what we do, I invite you to visit our website, medievalacademy.org and uh, see uh, where you can learn about our programming and our publications. I hope you are well. I hope you're staying safe and that you are doing what you need to do to keep your family and your community safe as well. I'm gonna hand it back to Winston and we'll get things started. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. All right, a bit about how this webinar will work. In our first hour, we'll have short presentations from several experts in medieval history or the history of disease who will provide their impressions of how our understanding of the medieval pandemic known as the Black Death is changing during the current COVID-19 pandemic. In the second hour, the speakers will have a discussion and respond to questions from uh, viewers and attendees. Uh, we're going to be collecting these questions through Twitter. If you have a question at any point during the first or second hour, uh, please tweet it with the hashtag MAAWebinar, one word. Uh, those instructions are also being put up on the Zoom chat. You can see that there. Uh, we'll be collecting these uh, and also monitoring the Medieval Academy's Twitter account uh, at Medieval Academy. So uh, to get started for real, we're going to hear from Dr. Monica H. Green. She's going to give us a brief introduction to the latest developments in the science and history of the Black Death. Dr. Green is an independent scholar and an elected fellow of the Medieval Academy of America. Her publications include a variety of studies on medicine by, for, and about women in medieval Europe, and for the past 20 years, she's been studying the adoption of Arabic medicine in 11th and 12th century Europe. For the past 15 years, she's also been teaching and studying the history of the world's major infectious diseases, drawing on new research in bioarchaeology and genetics to analyze their origins and global transmissions. Her book, The Black Death, A Global History, is in progress. Monica? Thank you, Winston. And I'm just loading up my PowerPoint here. 
and we're ready to go. Okay, is that visible? Can you hear me? Sounds good, yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Good, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us. I will be going actually rather quickly through my presentation. I will post the PowerPoint slides um, on the, uh, th through a connection um, with a Google Doc um, uh, uh, through the Medieval Academy site. So if you're not catching something now, you can, um, you can consult it later. And, and of course, any questions that you have, we can, we can take up in the Q&A. So what I want to do is um, set the scene um, to basically say why we have gathered all of these people um, together and why we needed to gather all of these people together. Because 10 years ago, none of us would ever have conceived of the need, the necessity, the possibility of getting so many people together. So what we need to talk about is what has transpired in the past 10 years um, and, and what will continue to transpire because all of these are ongoing research questions and research trajectories. So very quickly, I wanna um, compare the old and the new. So as the old, I'm going back all the way to last weekend um, uh, with a piece that appeared in the New York Times. Um, and uh, I'll just read the quote. Historians describe three great waves of plague, said Mary Fussell, a historian at Johns Hopkins. The plague of Justinian in the sixth century, the medieval epidemic in the 14th century, and a pandemic that struck in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The medieval pandemic began in 1331 in China. The illness, along with a civil war that was raging at the time, killed half the population of China. From there, the plague moved along trade routes to Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. In the years between 1347 and 1351, it killed at least a third of the European population. Okay. Um, so let's um, take this one piece at a time. So historians describe three great waves of plague. Yes, in fact, we do. But now we describe even more than three. Um, what I'm showing you here, and um, uh, I'll, I'll give you the link later to the uh, full size image so you can look at it up close. This is the most recent phylogenetic tree for the organism that causes plague, Yersinia pestis. And what it is showing essentially is the whole global history of the organism to the extent that we can document it um, right now. So what I have circled there is just the Black Death. If you look around in the middle, you'll see something that's written in red. It's labeled Justinianic Plague. And then at the top, all those blue bubbles, um, that's the third pandemic, the last proliferation in the modern world. But look at all the other branches. Look at all of that other bushiness on the tree. Those are likely pandemics themselves or great proliferations we should say, of Yersinia pestis. Some of those are living. So the gray, um, uh, the green, um, uh, the yellow, those are all living strains of plague that still exist in the world today. The areas that are shaded, so that big pink one that's down in the bottom, that's the late Neolithic Bronze Age plague. That's how far back we can go in plague's history now. So three great waves, no probably we have to estimate five or eight or maybe even more. We don't even know yet. Second assertion, the medieval pandemic began in 1331 in China. No, it didn't begin in China. It was taken to China. You'll hear more about that from um, Robert Himes in a few minutes. It didn't begin in 1331. The Big Bang, the right at the center at, of the stripped down phylogenetic tree in the image here, the Big Bang likely happened before 1218. Um, plague outbreaks are documented in China from 1218 on. So we're pushing our narrative back by a whole century, century and a half. Next assertion, from there, from China, the plague moved along trade routes to Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Well, yes, in fact, it did move but my own work suggests that it was not via trade route. So I'm picking up on work that Bob Himes did in 2014. 
and suggests that the major long distance movements in the 13th century were neither gradual nor due to trade. What was going on in the 13th century is the Mongol conquest. And that I think is the, um, uh, the biggest factor that is both disrupting plague out of its long-term marmot reservoirs in Kyrgyzstan and then moving it to various sites along the military route that the Mongols are taking. Final assertion, in the years between 1347 and 1351, it killed at least a third of the European population. Um, yes, um, uh, in fact, we are agreed with that, but if anything, all new estimates that are made on the basis of local um, documentation, whatever kind of documentation it is, is going to up that um, estimate to 40%, 50%. Some places uh, we can show 60%, 70% or total depopulation of certain areas. So there's, there's quite a range, um, but um, mostly we start at about 40%. It also killed a lot of people outside of Europe. And this is the, the, the larger and bigger thing that many, um, many different kinds of researchers now are trying to document. So I'm giving you an example over on the right side of a um, revised version of a uh, chart that Stuart Borsch and Tarek Sabra published initially in 2017. So their total over on the left-hand side, total depopulation of the Middle East 42%. Now look at individual cities, Cairo, 54% mortality from the Black Death. Damascus, 60% mortality. Samarkand, 50% mortality. These are monstrous, these are huge, these are the largest that we know of for any human populations in the history of humans. Okay, so the scope of the pandemic, the scope of, of research, what's new going on? This is a, an assertion I made in 2016, and if anything, it still holds um, uh, even more strongly now. Accepting the precepts of an evolutionary perspective on the history of Yersinia pestis. So accepting the truth, the implications of that phylogenetic tree that we were looking at before suggests that the field of historical plague studies as it relates to the second pandemic must be redefined in three dimensions, its geographic extent, its chronological extent, and the methodological registers we use to investigate it. So the geographic extent I've already talked about, basically we're talking about much of Northern Eurasia, um, uh, certainly, and um, uh, going all the way from China to the, to the Atlantic or going both directions, um, eastward to China and westward to the Atlantic, and from Eurasia into Africa. And we'll be hearing more about that from uh, Gerard Chouin. Um, the chronological extent, as I've already said, we have to move back to the beginning of what we think of as the Black Death to the 13th century or maybe even to the end of the 12th century. And we have to bring it forward to the present day because as I said, many of these strains are still living in the world. And the methodological register, and that's basically what you're going to be hearing for the next two hours, is how all hands need to be on deck. That we need genetics and the archaeology and the, the old fashioned um, history. We need art history. We need literary analysis. We need climate science. Um, we need zoology, um, uh, uh, palynology. Um, maybe we don't even know um, all the different things that, that need to come to bear to our analyses now. So um, the big thing, and I don't have time to, 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 to recap this part of the story. Um, in 2011, Yersinia pestis was retrieved from the Black Death Cemetery in London. Not simply was, were fragments of Yersinia pestis retrieved, and that had happened um, in other grave sites before, but they were able to sequence the whole genome. And once you have the whole genome from a historical sample, you can compare it to modern samples. And the conclusion was that the 14th century Yersinia pestis wasn't that different genetically from the organism that we understand in the world today. And the, one of the big things that that means for us as historians is that we can take modern scientific studies of Yersinia pestis and infer that Yersinia pestis acted, behaved the same way um, in the historical past. So this is just an example of, of um, a slide I, I, I used to, to teach students. 
is um, uh, just understanding what is the course of the disease? How quickly does it kill? How would it have manifested itself? What would people, and again, all of these people in, in the past prior to the end of the 19th century would not have seen microbes. They would have seen the manifestation of symptoms, but that's part of what we want to understand now is what would those manifestations look like? How fast was the course of the disease? How lethal was it? This looks like a dandelion. In fact, it's the gut of a flea that's been infested with Yersinia pestis and all those uh, little yellow petals. Um, there are uh, bacilli of Yersinia pestis that are proliferating in the gut of the flea. This is a study that was just published a couple of weeks ago and is probably going to transform our understanding of the role of fleas in the proliferation of plague. So this is our traditional map. You've seen this map, or you've seen versions of it before, first published by Benedictow in 2004. And it's showing the traditional understanding of the Black Death as a European phenomenon. This is the map we have to change. Not because this map is necessarily wrong in the information it gives, it's all the blank areas on the edges. The paleogenetics, the um, uh, retrieval of uh, the molecular fossils of Yersinia pestis has for the most part also been a Eurocentric project to date. So this is a map showing where all the samples of second plague pandemics um, uh, genomes have come from uh, now. And you'll see the only exception is moving over there on the Don River, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, on the Volga uh, River uh, in uh, southern Russia where we have a couple of samples um, from there. This, I suspect, will be a big way in which plague studies changes in the next few years, is once we get, start getting samples from outside of Europe, I think our picture is going to change radically. And this is just the last um, uh, uh, point that I want to make about our changed understanding. This is the map from a study that was just released a few days ago uh, by a historian, Hannah Barker, um, and uh, it's an amazing, amazing study, and it is completely old-fashioned in its methods. She's using diplomatic records um, to revisit the story that all of us have heard about another group of Mongols, the Mongols of the Golden Horde, being involved in the uh, siege of Kaffa, um, which is this uh, city of... Uh, right on the, the edge of, of Crimea facing into the Black Sea. And the, the traditional story is plague breaks out in the, uh, among the Mongol troops. They start throwing their plague-ridden bodies over the walls of Kaffa. And then the Genoese and the Venetian merchants then get infected um, because of that. They jump on their ships, flee Kaffa, and take the disease back with them to Italy and the rest of the Mediterranean. Now, it is certainly true that it was the Italians that took plague um, uh, uh, across the Black Sea and into the Mediterranean. And there was a siege. In fact, there were a couple of sieges of Kaffa. But it was not that incident that transmitted plague to Western Europe and the Mediterranean. It was rather at a different port of Tana, which is there on the Don River, which is shipping out apparently contaminated grain. And that might likely be one of the most common ways that plague is moving around. And what that does is it tells us something that we, we've also been learning from modern studies of emerging diseases is emerging diseases very often are involved in food supply issues. Is that people are, are um, uh, attempting to find ways to, to feed themselves, sometimes in uh, uh, foods that they consider luxury, sometimes foods that are, are, are quite normal. But something as mundane as, as grain supplies may have been the principal way in which uh, play got spread around in the 1340s, passing from Constantinople um, into the Mediterranean. So I'll end now um, by showing you um, some maps that I have had uh, drawn um, and um, a thousand thanks to Erica Fagan um, for doing this work on very short order for me. And um, these are tentative uh, maps, but, but these are maps that we have to have at some level to capture our thinking um, and our, our, our way of understanding what we think we know.
So I am making an assertion, this is an uh, article that will be coming out in a few months, that we need to take the origin of the Black Death back into the 13th century and connect it to the Mongols. Um, and um, so the story starts in Kyrgyzstan, um, in the marmot populations there, and we have a spillover event, that the disease moves into um, uh, new populations, and then humans are the ones who transmit it back to Mongolia, to the north, they um, transmit it eastward um, to China, and they transmit it westward, uh, ending up uh, eventually in the Caucasus. In the 14th century, then we have our traditional story of the Black Death as coming out of um, the Mongol horde, the area north of the Caucasus, and moving into the Mediterranean. We also have a story that we really haven't understood that well um, of plague in China in this period. And then a new story that Jirash Wan has been starting to put together that maybe plague also um, crossed the Sahara and reached Western Africa. And then finally, 15th century, um, now uh, uh, the world um, apparently is firmly into the Little Ice Age, very, very cold. And um, we have new transmissions of plagues, some of them long distance, um, some of them fairly local. Um, new reservoirs of plague have been established and those reservoirs will keep creating plague outbreaks for the next four to 500 years. So plague is, is an, it was an emerging disease in the 13th century and became um, normalized. So that's the layout that I wanted to, um, uh, to start with. And I will turn things back over to Winston now and the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much, Monica, for that uh, vital introduction to the new paradigm of plague studies that will uh, give all of us uh, some of the necessary background uh, to understand our five presenters, uh, each of whom will address a more specific topic related to the Black Death. So our first presenter is Robert Himes, the Carpentier Professor of Chinese History at Columbia University. His work focuses on the history of middle period and early modern China, using the approaches of the social and cultural historian to study elite culture, family and kinship, medicine, religion, and most recently, the possibility that the second plague pandemic first manifested itself in 13th century China. His monographs, Statesmen and Gentlemen, The Elite of Fuzhou, Qiangxi in Northern and Southern Sung from 1986, and Wei and Bai Wei, Taoism, Local Religion, and Models of Divinity in Sung and Modern China from 2002, both won the Joseph Levinson Prize of the Association for Asian Studies for the best book on pre-1900 China in their years of publication. Dr. Himes will speak to us about plague in 13th century China. Bob. Thanks very much. Thanks, Winston. And thanks, Monica. Thanks, everybody who's joining us for this um, extraordinary webinar. Um, I'm, I have to apologize. I will be reading. Um, I have found from sad experience that when I don't read, I leave important things out. So. Uh, perhaps it's an age issue. Um, my interest in possible plague in middle period China began in graduate school when I was struck by the coincidence of massive population loss across the 14th century at both ends of Eurasia. In Europe, we knew about the Black Death. For the China side, I knew William McNeil's work without being very impressed by his evidence. Now, as it happens, the demographic correspondence is not exact, since in China, we now know large scale population loss happened in two separate hits. According to the plausible reconstruction by Zhao Wenlin and Xie Xu Jin, about 30% lost between 1208 and 1292, overwhelmingly concentrated in North China, where regional losses may have been 70% or more, and about a further 20% between 1351 and 1381, concentrated more in the South. The former period encompassed the Mongol conquest and transition from Jin to Yuan in the North and Song to Yuan in the South. The latter period spanned the transition from Yuan to Ming. Today, I'll be talking mostly about the Jin to Yuan part, the 13th century, as that's what I've mostly worked on so far. My PhD student, Stephen Boynton, first introduced me to the work of Li Gao, the remarkable physician who lived through the Mongol siege of Kaifeng in 1232 and wrote about it 15 years later. 
Li was so struck by the Kaifeng epidemic that he invented a new system of medicine called internal damage theory to account for it in place of the cold damage theory of epidemic dominant in his time. And he told of roughly a million dead of disease in the space of two months at Kaifeng after the Mongols temporarily lifted their siege in the fifth and sixth months of 1232. His numbers are roughly confirmed by the state history of Jin in, in different enough terms that one can say that um, it, the history of Jin is not drawing on, on Li Gao's work. Li also reported that very similar epidemics had struck three other major cities in North China in the 12 teens and 1220s and implied that there were still others. Some of you will have read my epilogue to Monica Green's inaugural issue of the Medieval Globe in which I brought together Li Gao's testimony other historical mentions of epidemics associated with Mongol armies during their conquest of Jin and Song, and the historical genetic evidence um, as of Eugene Sui's um, and Eugene Sui et al.'s 2013 study to frame an initial hypothesis of Mongol imported plague. Here I'll be talking about what I've been up to since then. Uh, but why should big epidemics associated with the Mongols be plague? Um, for the general historical genetics argument for connecting plague to the Mongol expansion, I'd refer you to what Monica Green has already said here from her recent work, which has um, mastered the, the genetic evidence far better than I have done so far. Um, and in a bit, I'll talk about medical changes I've found in the period that I think specifically signal plague. But first, I'd like to touch briefly on my most recent work, which has brought me back to Dr. Li Gao himself, to do some belated source critical work in trying to answer this question. We know from other sources that Li Gao was actually at Kaifeng in 1232, but given what Hannah Barker and others have shown us about the unreliability of some non-eyewitness sources on the European Black Death, why should we take Li Gao seriously about epidemics in scattered cities across the North China Plain 10 and 20 years before Kaifeng, when there's no evidence he was in those places at those times? First, can we get a sense of how he would have known about such events and second, do other sources confirm any of what he says about the other cities? Uh, the results of this new work, which I'm still in the process of writing up, have exceeded my expectations. On the question of how Li Gao knew things, I've been able to reconstruct his network of patients, and this network of patients based uh, mainly on records post-1232, um, a work I think had never been done before, though Reiko Shino had nicely shown the strength of Li's relationship with the poet and historiographer Yuan Hao Wen. What emerges is that Li Gao was one of the best networked people in North China under the Jin and Yuan. His patients, and it's clear these were not merely people he treated, but people he hung out with as something like social equals, included many of the most prominent gentry or officials of the late Jin. And if one maps their places of origin, and I'd love to show you this map, but so far it's only hand drawn. Um, if one maps their places of origin, one finds that they span pretty much the whole North China plain most significantly that Li had treated or befriended individual men who came from each of the cities he tells us about, or in one case from right next door. He was perfectly positioned, living first at the capital and then in a couple of cities that were major elite drawing points uh, after 1232. He was perfectly positioned to ask the people he met and treated, so what happened in your hometown when the Mongols came through? Giving new meaning to the phrase, taking a history. Second, among the very few mentions, other mentions of epidemics in Jin sources are three long epitaphs by Li's patient and friend, Yuan Hao Wan. In each epitaph, Yuan briefly mentions that his subject confronted epidemic at some point in office, and in each case, one can reconstruct that the place this happened was the near vicinity of one of the cities specifically mentioned by Li Gao, and that the time matches a Mongol siege of that city. In short, we know how Li Gao could know the things he tells us, and Yuan Haowan's three epitaphs provide broad confirmation of his specific testimony. But again, why, apart from the very general message of historical genetics, why think these North Chinese epidemics were plague? In previous work that unfortunately I haven't yet published, I've examined Chinese medical sources from the 12th through 15th centuries that describe known categories of epidemic disease. These are not, I want to be clear, dated records of specific outbreaks, but rather catalogs of diseases and corresponding treatments. What the examination shows is that over the course of the 13th century, on a pivot around 1250, and note that these are dates of medical books, not of ep epidemic outbreaks, again, over the course of the 13th century, categories of epidemic disease that had been previously known and described rather suddenly begin to add a new symptom to their descriptions, a large purulent sore. This new symptomatic addition spans several pre-existing Chinese categories of febrile and potentially fatal epidemic disease, things called 
variously, big head, thunderhead, seasonal toxin, and seasonal epidemic, none of which had previously been described as involving sores of any kind, though they had been previously described, and now suddenly their description has changed. That is, rather than see a new disease in the epidemics they were encountering, it seems Chinese medical writers absorbed, the, absorbed these new epidemics into existing categories of epidemic disease, but with the addition of a very notable symptom, a large purulent sore. One of the words for the purulent sores attested after 1250 for these epidemic disease categories <coughs> is the Chinese term guda, which has its own evolution and history and in modern times can even mean just something that's just a pimple, but it was a brand new term in epidemic medicine after 1250, previously used in non-medical contexts to mean essentially a lump or a knot, but now applied to an epidemic symptom for the first time and consistently described as discolored, red, purple, or black, pus-bearing, and large. The word survives in epidemic discourse for the next several centuries, and one can chart its ups and downs. Um, significantly, its next big up after the Yuan, which is when it first appears again, comes at the Ming-Qing transition in the 17th century, when some authors have speculatively seen plague in the rampant epidemics of that time. My proposal, of course, is that this brand new epidemic symptom first recorded in the 13th century is the bubo of plague. At this point, one can return yet again to Li Gao. I had always been frustrated by how little he has to say about symptoms. He does describe how other doctors at Kaifeng, and actually the other doctors could have included himself, um, since he was known as a specialist in cold damage disease, he does describe how other doctors mistakenly treated the disease they misdiagnosed, as he sees it, as cold damage. But most of, the, most of the techniques that he reports reflect standard cold damage therapy and are directed largely at reducing fever. And one already, already knew that this was a febrile epidemic disease with a lot of fatality. So those, the reports of those techniques don't tell us very much else about what's going on. But one technique he mentions had deceived me for some time because I had wrongly thought it referred to purging. This was, to translate the Chinese phrase, to push with croton seed. He tells us that doctors were pushing their patients with croton seed. The term in Chinese is bado. And um, if you don't know what croton seed is, I, I didn't either um, until recently. And it's um, a large shrub or tree that, that produces seeds or nuts that actually even today um, can be used, are sometimes used as purgatives, although they're such a powerful purgative that they're dangerous. On a closer pursuit of medical meanings of push, the Chinese term is tui, it turned out that it can mean to massage or rub, and croton seed, it turned out when I looked at the previous couple of centuries worth of prescription catalogs, was not only a purgative, but when made into a liniment, was commonly rubbed onto sores to get them to burst and give up pus. That is, the doctors Li Gao watched treat febrile patients in danger of death at Kaifeng in 1232 were, among other things, trying to get purulent sores to burst. Li Gao himself never used the word gada. It emerges a bit after him, though mainly among physicians who had been his students. But in telling us of the use of croton seed, he was indirectly telling us that at Kaifeng, he saw patients with large purulent sores. That is, I would argue, Li Gao, Li Gao saw bubos. And I'm going to be going on from here um, to work more than I have so far on 14th century sources, which are much more abundant in terms of records of epidemic disease, whether they epi they're the sheer records of epidemic disease can be um, shown to yield useful information, whether there will be witnesses um, of the quality of Li Gao, for instance, um, I'm yet, uh, as yet very uncertain, but um, I'm going forward from here. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, that's exciting to hear some updates on your 2014 piece, which I've used in several of my classes. I'm looking forward to your upcoming work. Our next speaker is Gerard Schwann, who will address the question of plague in Africa. Dr. Schwann is a scholar of the history and archaeology of pre Atlantic and early modern Atlantic West Africa, especially the Gulf of Guinea. He holds degrees in African history from the Pantheon Sorbonne University and in anthropology from Syracuse University. He spent 20 years in Ghana, Nigeria, and the Gambia as a project manager in education. 
for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and as a lecturer at the University of Ghana, the University of Cape Coast, and the University of the Gambia. From 2010 to 2013, he chaired the French Institute for Research in Africa at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. He now teaches medieval and modern histories of Africa at the College of William and Mary. He's the author of numerous essays on the history of trade and disease in West Africa, and is currently writing a chapter entitled Diseased Landscapes in Pre-Modern Tropical Africa for a forthcoming volume edited by Laurie Jones. Gerard? Thank you, uh, Winston. Thank you, uh, Monica, for uh, inviting me. And uh, let me extend my greetings to our uh, listeners, uh, maybe some from Africa or some from um, French-speaking countries. Bonjour à tous. Um, what I would like to, uh, to talk about today is um, about what I call the plague uh, hypothesis in Africa. And I would like to retrace a little bit the, the history of this hypothesis and, and then conclude with uh, what, uh, what are the new um, steps we are taking towards uh, trying to um, strengthen the hypothesis today. So all of these started in the early 2000s in uh, southern Ghana uh, when I realized uh, that some specific settlement site that uh, are surrounded by a ditch system and that we call earthworks in Ghana uh, had been abandoned in mass at the regional scale uh, in the 14th century. And so we were in the, uh, in the early 2000s. And when I started thinking about it, um, definitively because of the, the date, I, I, I looked at uh, global events that could explain, you know, um, uh, um, the yeah, quite brutal abandonment of settlements at a large scale. And the idea of, uh, of, of the plague uh, came to my mind, and therefore I started uh, delving into uh, this question of the plague in Africa. And I realized that there was not much about it. Actually, there was, I would say, almost nothing um, outside a couple of footnotes uh, in articles by Poznanski or by uh, the Macintosh, for instance. So um, uh, nobody really asked you know, about uh, the plague in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think the idea was that Africa was imagined largely disconnected from the world uh, in the 14th century, which obviously we know uh, it wasn't. Uh, many people have also um, looked at the Sahara as a barrier. And you know, uh, in, uh, in the uh, historiography of Africa, barriers or imagined barriers are many. Uh, you have the Sahara, you have the tropical forest. Uh, well, when we look closely at these uh, uh, so-called barriers, we realize that actually they were not barriers uh, and that people, goods, uh, ideas, uh, circulated across these so-called barriers. Um, also, uh, we know that um, uh, trans-Saharan routes were important in um, connecting sub-Saharan Africa to the rest of the Mediterranean world, but we also know that Africa was also largely open uh, on the Red Sea and uh, in uh, East Africa, uh, and therefore, even if the Sahara would have been a barrier, uh, the disease might have also come from other, uh, through other routes. Uh, so, you know, Monica uh, Green suggested uh, uh, that, you know, in, in the world pandemic, we should pay attention to the etymology of the world and that there is pan in pandemic. And therefore, uh, 
if Africa was not affected, we needed to actually find out why, right? But um, because it's a pandemic, uh, uh, many of us thought that um, Africa could have been uh, uh, infected um, by this disease. Now, the problem was very much the invisibility of the disease uh, in the record. And I, I'm actually quite interested in this question of invisibility. Um, I listened to a blog uh, yesterday uh, that was shared by uh, Monica and the question of what will be left in the record of COVID-19 in the future emerged and actually, you know, this is something we can wonder, you know, uh, how would this disease be represented in the future um, in different parts of the world? Uh, if you look at the situation in Africa today, um, pertaining to the COVID-19, you also see that there are definitively issues of visibility. Uh, who has really uh, gotten a clear understanding of what is going on in Africa uh, with this novel coronavirus. Uh, certainly not me, and I, I do follow uh, as much as I can uh, uh, channels of information that um, um, you know, exist. So um, this issue of, uh, of invisibility, I think, was uh, you know, a, a major aspect of what we try to, um, to, to deal with. And actually, um, we, uh, we came together in a project called Global Africa uh, that was actually organized um, from 2015 to 2018. And a small uh, group of us, um, including uh, Monica Green, uh, but also including uh, colleagues from uh, the University of Oregon, uh, Daphne Gallagher, Stephen Dupin, and Marilo Dura for Ethiopia uh, from CNRS France. Uh, we came together and, and started um, rethinking about the question. And, in uh, 2018, the results of our preliminary thoughts came out in a, a volume of Afrique, uh, who is actually an open uh, source, uh, open uh, edition that everyone can access. Uh, we published a special issue of this journal uh, that was entitled Black Death and its Aftermath in Sub-Saharan Africa, a Critical Exploration of Silence. Um, so um, I would like to invite you to, to have a look at this, uh, this issue, obviously. Um, I would say that we did not demonstrate uh, that the plague indeed had spread to Africa. Um, well, we did. When I say we did not demonstrate, it means that uh, we were not able to recover ancient DNA from uh, remains of victims of the plague like we have done in, um, in, uh, in England, for instance. Uh, but we were able to build together a number of evidences that were, I think, quite convincing. Uh, these evidences pertain to West Africa and to the archaeology of West Africa, uh, especially the um, looking at settlement patterns uh, and change in settlement patterns uh, after the 14th century. Uh, we also have a study on Ethiopia, which is really interesting because uh, for the first time, I think we realized that there were actually written sources about the disease uh, in Africa, in Ethiopia, uh, and that these um, written records, written sources, had not really been explored because, once again, no one had, had really uh, asked the question about uh, the plague in Africa. 
And then we got a wonderful uh, study uh, on the genetics of the plague, uh, an interpretation of modern genetics of the plague by Monica Green, uh, who demonstrates that uh, the closest living strain of uh, the Black Death uh, leaves is still alive in East Africa, suggesting uh, that the disease uh, actually circulated indeed uh, in East Africa uh, at some point uh, after the 14th century. So um, um, in uh, March 2019, we had a, a conference uh, in Paris and um, that conference was actually important for several reasons. Uh, first is that we, we met uh, with uh, Javier Pizarro Seda, the head of the Yesenia Research Unit at the Pasteur Institute. Um, and he told us that there was a project to actually study and publish the genomes of all the samples of Yesenia pestis that are kept uh, at the Pasteur Institute. Uh, and some of these are actually uh, coming from Africa. And so when this data is available, I think uh, uh, genetics, uh, geneticians and then historians will be able to put their heads together and then uh, build on uh, the narrative that Monica Green has put together. Uh, the second important aspect, I think, of this conference is that it um, actually uh, resulted in the formation of an informal group of researcher, uh, which uh, we call uh, IETAS, all right? Uh, why IETAS? Uh, because we, we all look at the question of the pandemics in Africa from an archaeological perspective, and we questioned the visibility of the pandemics in the archaeological record. Um, ask yourself, you know, what will become of the billions of masks and other um, uh, protective devices um, that um, were produced and were consumed uh, in a few months globally? Oh, um, I, I was reading that France only uh, needs about 15 million masks a week, all right? Will they leave a trace in the archaeological record that we will leave behind? Uh, when it comes to the archaeological record of 14th century Africa, uh, we ask ourselves, you know, how would a pandemic uh, which left no written record outside uh, Ethiopia, how would the pandemic be visible in the archeological record? And what we noticed was uh, a number of gaps or hiatus, uh, which might not be significant, uh, you know, uh, uh, in taken individually, but would become really significant when uh, they are all taken together uh, characterizing what we think was a societal crisis uh, at a large uh, scale. And um, I would like just to give a couple of examples of uh, uh, the type of questions and the type of evidence we are trying to, to deal with uh, currently. One of them is the issue of uh, what we call a technological hiatus. Um, and to illustrate this point, um, I'm using um, evidence uh, collected by a Franco-Nigerian uh, team led by Roderick Guillon, Christophe Petit, and Jean-Louis Rajo in, uh, um, in uh, Niger, uh, close to Niamey. Uh, there, uh, they uh, looked at iron metallurgy um, and they um, were able to document a very well dated continuous sequence of uh, iron production uh, between uh, the second and the 14th century of our era. And then a gap between the 14th century and the 17th century. 
And when iron metallurgy comes back in the region, uh, maybe in the, fourth, in the 17th century, uh, none of the technologies used uh, uh, are inherited from the technologies that uh, they documented before the 14th century. Uh, so um, our work as a, as a group is uh, to reflect on these and re-examine the archaeological record in the uh, region and see if we have a pattern or not. Um, we could actually make uh, a parallel with glass bead production uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and especially at Ife uh, in southwestern Nigeria. Um, uh, Ife was uh, a, a, a center of um, massive production of glass beads. Um, the production itself is not very well dated. Uh, probably 12th to 14th century, maybe earlier. Um, and um, there are questions about the continuation or not of the glass bead industries after the 14th century. Um, we also have uh, shifts in ceramic production during the same period. Like if all industries connected with the mastering of fire had been impacted in a way or another. If, uh, like if many technological secrets, recipes uh, had not been transmitted in a society where they could not be uh, written down. Um, to end um, my presentation, um, just give you an idea of a couple other points that we are looking at in terms of hiatus. Um, we are looking, for instance, at uh, the presence of unusual artifacts uh, left behind by people who seem to have fled uh, settlement sites precipitately. Uh, and we are talking here of iron. We are talking also of all kinds of, uh, of copper and um, copper alloys uh, objects, which you usually do not find in archaeological context unless uh, they are associated with a burial because these objects uh, were recycled. And in the 14th century, we have, uh, I would say, an abnormal number of sites where you actually recover uh, such uh, artifacts. This is uh, a question. And, and this is, again, a question we are looking at in Ife uh, with uh, the presence of these very well-known bronze heads, um, which are in themselves an anomaly in the archaeological uh, record. We also look at abandoned uh, landscapes, uh, and, and particularly abandoned farmland. And we um, we have we start building um, uh, evidence of um, field boundaries, uh, intensive land use in areas around Niamey, for instance, uh, which became abandoned, um, and and similar um, questions with the Eastern earthworks of southern Nigeria. It looks like if some of these areas were very densely populated uh, before the 14th century. And then these landscapes were basically abandoned uh, sometime by the end of the 14th century. Uh, this is, um, uh, we think, an echo of a possible demographic uh, shock and movement of population during this period. Of course, we are also looking at biological markers. Uh, we are still looking at mass graves. And um, uh, we, we understand that mass graves are not automatic artifacts uh, of uh, the plague. There are uh, many uh, ways people uh, dealt with uh, the dead. Um, that are not all 
uh, mass graves. Yet, uh, we have one case of a mass grave um, uh, in Benin City that was excavated in the 1960s by um, um, archaeologist Graham Connor. Uh, and we actually try to extract ancient DNA from this uh, material, but we were not successful at doing so. There was actually no ancient DNA at all. Uh, no human ancient DNA, no pathogenic ancient DNA. But we have a new site, uh, which has been now um, explored by uh, Richard Oslisley at the Irungu cave uh, in Gabon, with 30 individuals left, uh, with more than 520 objects of iron and copper. And um, we... Um, Richard is, is part of our uh, group and we hope to be able to uh, extract uh, ancient DNA and maybe more information from these particular types of site. And uh, finally, uh, the last um, aspects of our research concerns uh, political transformation uh, in Africa around the 14th century. And uh, one of the very fascinating uh, questions that we are raising is um, this um, um, appearance in the landscape of multiple types of um, uh, walls. Um, like if the um, political landscape uh, had become uh, very fragmented. And we have very good evidence of um, uh, this type of transformation in southern Nigeria, but also uh, in Burkina Faso, and also maybe, and we are looking at that uh, in Niger. Uh, so altogether, uh, we are basically trying to strengthen this uh, picture and um, to um, continue building the argument in favor of the plague in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason why we do so is that it matters uh, in terms of the history of, uh, of Africa. I, I always tell colleagues, uh, imagine the history of Europe um, without uh, any knowledge of uh, the second uh, pandemic of plague. Uh, our perspective of this history would be so different. The question we would ask to our records would be so different. And I think uh, introducing the plague uh, into the historiography of uh, Africa also has a, a very powerful potential in terms of uh, shaking the historiography and asking new questions uh, to our uh, archaeological and also documentary uh, records in Africa. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Gerard. Uh, so we've moved from China to West Africa, and our next speaker will take us to the Ottoman Empire. This is uh, Nuket Varlik. She is an associate professor of history at Rutgers University, Newark, and the University of South Carolina. She's a historian of the Ottoman Empire, interested in disease, medicine, and public health. She's the author of Plague and Empire in the Early Modern Mediterranean World, the Ottoman Experience, 1347 to 1600, and editor of Plague and Contagion in the Islamic Mediterranean. Her new book project, Empire, Ecology, and Plague, Rethinking the Second Pandemic, circa 1340s to circa 1940s, notice that date range there, <laughs> examines the 600-year Ottoman plague experience in a global ecological context. In conjunction with this research, she's involved in developing the Black Death Digital Archive, 
and contributing to multidisciplinary research projects that incorporate perspectives from paleogenetics, bioarchaeology, disease ecology, and climate science into historical inquiry. She's also the editor of the Journal of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Dr. Varlik. All right, thank you, uh, Winston, for the introduction. Thank you for this organization and thank you everyone for joining us today. Let me just start by sharing my screen. Can you see it? Okay, all right, thank you. So, um, all right, I'll uh, quickly start by saying that Plague, plague Scholarship, but Black Death Scholarship in particular, has been, until very recently, uh, very um, Eurocentric. And this is just Exhibit A, <laughs> um, a plague map, um, a map of the Black Death that's been circulating for the last 15 years or so. Um, used by many scholars to understand the spread of the, uh, the Black Death. And again, please note that it focuses almost entirely on, on Europe. Um, whereas if we want to extend the geographic scope of uh, the Black Death pandemic and the second pandemic uh, overall, we're probably thinking about a phenomenon that affected Africa and Eurasia. So um, this map is a representation of the um, urban connectivity of the mid 14th century in the Afro-Eurasian world, which is probably a better indication of the potential spread of the disease uh, along the various routes of, of the time period. Uh, but I am going to focus on the Ottoman Empire today and uh, take you to basically the core lands of the Ottoman, uh, in which the Ottoman Empire uh, grew and developed in the mid 14th century. Of course, the Ottomans were not an empire, were a uh, small uh, regional pr principality in a Northwest uh, Anatolia. And uh, what we see here is possibly a map showing, at least on the basis of available historical do documents, uh, possibly showing some um, spread of uh, potential uh, trajectories of spread of, of plague during the Black Death in um, Anatolia and its environments. So, um, so you know, the, the goal of, um, one of the goals of this recent shift in the scholarship that Monica Green earlier on uh, mentioned with the new paradigm of plague and my colleagues also elaborated on just trying to diversify uh, plague scholarship by bringing different geographic areas that we knew very little about into the picture and trying to understand how the knowledge of these um, lesser studied areas, their experience of plague, can contribute to our understanding of the Black Death pandemic specifically, but the larger uh, picture of the second pandemic, um, generally speaking. So, um, and as a result, or um, as a result of the contributions made uh, by scholars looking to expand uh, the geographic scope of the pandemic um, outside of Europe. Now we know a little better about uh, the questions of the spread of plague, but also questions uh, about its uh, long-term persistence, especially in certain parts of the world, which I think uh, the Ottoman Empire is, is important uh, to, to, to study in this context, but I'll come back to that in just, just a minute. So uh, when we want to understand the Ottoman experience of disease, I think in addition to referring to the geography question that uh, we just uh, mentioned, I think it's also important to think about the temporality of plague or temporality of plague pandemics. Uh, in particular, the second pandemic, again, um, studies that have based themselves on the European experience of plague have emphasized that the plague pandemic, the Black Death pandemic, basically the initial uh, outbreak of the second 
uh, pandemic may have lasted for a while, but we don't know exactly when the second pandemic ended. And in fact, this is a question that we cannot answer on the basis of European records and European experience alone. So for that reason also, studying the Ottoman experience tells me something about how we can rethink the temporal uh, scope of the second pandemic. And in fact, to complicate it, uh, by revising our existing knowledge, our existing understanding of um, the uh, persistence of the second pandemic over the course of several centuries. Um, according to the more um, conventional historiography, um, Plague of London, 1665, or the Plague of Marseille, 1720s, usually considered as the end of the second pandemic, which is not the case if you look at the experience of Anatolia, the Balkans, Eastern Mediterranean, North Africa, the Middle East, largely speaking, this part of the world that the Ottoman Empire historically uh, controlled, plague continues a lot longer in terms of time, its time frame. And so even though generally um, scholars have argued, the Ottoman uh, historians have argued that the second pandemic ends somewhere in the 1840s, because of the establishment of quarantine institutions. Uh, my latest research basically demonstrates this was not the case. And in fact, we see that plague continues in at least parts of what the Ottoman Empire controlled into the modern period, even after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the early 20th century. Plague continues until the middle of 20th century. So in fact, we're looking at 600 years of continuous uh, plague spread. So very quickly, um, here on this map, we see some of the um, trajectories along which plague circulated in the early modern period in uh, the areas that the Ottoman Empire controlled. As you see, we see a very complex pattern of transmission of the disease. It is not transmitted as our early modern uh, historical observers, Western Europe historical observers claim that it was a linear spread from east to west from the Ottoman Empire to Europe. Well, we see a more, um, we see a more complex pattern of distribution. So it's not only east to west, but it's west to east, east to west, east to north to south, so all sorts of directions. And in fact, this is something, as uh, some of the other speakers earlier mentioned, something that is connected to um, uh, patterns of local mobility, circulation, sometimes uh, plague follow military trajectories, military routes, sometimes related to migration, sometimes trade and other forms of uh, human and non-human uh, mobilities. So um, uh, in my earlier uh, book, I uh, looked at the Ottoman experience of plague between 1347 to 1600 and trying to develop a periodization of plague um, uh, epidemics and their recurrences in the Ottoman world. Uh, but now I'm trying to develop a periodization of this larger 600 years of, of Ottoman plague experience. And in fact, trying to understand the periodization of the, the ebb and flow of the pandemic and its rhythm, its kind of, you know, moments of rise and retreat is helpful to put together a, a, a better understanding of the global history of the, the second uh, pandemic. But in doing so, there are a couple of things that we need to remember. Plague is a very complex disease. We're talking about the zoonotic disease that involves the agency of not only humans, but animals, rodents, arthropod vectors, fleas, and the larger environment. So it is when we look at only human response to plague or only how humans are affected, we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg. We need to diversify our understanding or study of, of the history of plague by bringing in these different actors. And to do this, well, as a historian, of course, you know, I study the human record, you know, historical sources, sources produced by humans. But this also gives, you know, um, a limited perspective on understanding uh, the history of plague. So the idea is to diversify uh, the study of past plagues by bringing in different um, actors by looking at non-written, non-textual uh, materials. And this is something that we can do by uh, collaborating with others and trying to bring a more interdisciplinary approach 
to the field of plague studies, which is already ripe and happening uh, very successfully over the last decade or so. Uh, we have multiple players in the field and multiple agendas and multiple research questions. Despite all this, we still have ongoing debates about the, or the question of the origin, the question of the spread, the question of the persistence of plague, and the question of the end of the second pandemic. So these are questions that we still continue to, um, to define and redefine. So, uh, but specific is, uh, focusing specifically on the Ottoman Empire and looking at the, uh, how uh, the Ottoman data can shed light onto some of these questions, I would like to make a few um, brief observations. And one of these is uh, the question of plague spread. And as I showed in my map earlier, at least it is possible to see that the spread of the plague during the second pandemic uh, followed much complex trajectories than earlier um, assumed. So it is possible to diversify uh, this picture even further by focusing on uh, regional studies and, and, and the local, um, local experiences of plague. The question of persistence, again, this is an ongoing debate which uh, European historians have been tackling uh, more closely because of the availability of paleogenetics uh, data, which is not possible in, at least in my case, um, territories that the Ottoman Empire ruled over in the Anatolian Balkans and North Africa mainly, there is currently no um, ancient DNA evidence. Hopefully when we have those, it will be possible to, to develop a better understanding of persistence uh, of plague. But on the basis of historical record alone, it is possible to make certain arguments regarding the persistence of plague on the diverse ecologies that the Ottoman Empire ruled over and put into um, uh, contact through its multiple uh, trajectories of, of empire building and empire administration and trade networks and all sorts of uh, human and non-human mobility that you see in an early modern empire. All of these mechanisms at least kept in place the, uh, the outbreaks of plague that kept recurring. Right. This may have different reasons in uh, or different uh, ecological components in urban or rural context. But what we know is you cannot have a zoonotic illness like the plague recur over 600 years of plague in the absence of local reservoirs, local rodent reservoirs. So for those three, for that reason, I am trying to look at well, what are the reservoir species? What are the host species of, of plague? And we know that a number of mammals and a number of rodents could, could host uh, the disease, but it will be important to identify uh, the rodent host of the disease. Very quickly on the question of the retreat of the pandemic or the end of the second pandemic, as I said, this is also uh, under discussion, but I am trying to pull it at least one century uh, forward, bringing it to the middle of the, 40, uh, middle of the 20th century. The last outbreak that I uh, found in my records is 1947, a small outbreak in the border between Turkey and Syria. A uh, very small outbreak, but it is like the last of the continuation of smaller regional um, outbreaks that took place in the 20th century. So it gives us an idea of the continuation, a long-term continuation and persistence of plague and uh, pandemic, uh, the second pandemic in this part of the world. Whereas of course we know in different parts of the world, as a result of its circulation during the, what we call the third pandemic, plague still persists to this day. Um, well, before my uh, time runs out, let me uh, just say one, make one more point, and that is about you know where does the um, where does the Ottoman uh, experience of plague sit in the the, the global uh, history of plague of the second pandemic, and in fact connecting it to the third pandemic, because as we know, uh, genetically speaking, there is a continuity between them. 
uh, but uh, historically speaking, we have yet to explore that connection um, more closely. We have outbreaks of plague happening in late 19th century and early 20th century in different parts of the Middle East, not you know, even outside of the Ottoman Empire and in Central Asia. And so that continuity is also something that need to be, um, needs to be explored uh, more closely. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nuket. So we've had uh, three excellent presentations which challenge our usual understanding of the Black Death as a mid 14th century Eurocentric phenomenon, taking it now to a global or at least hemispheric stage and challenging the chronology as well. But our final two speakers will bring us back to medieval Europe uh, as we now ask, uh, how do we now teach the Black Death and understand it uh, in its more typical uh, medieval European context? So coming up next is Dr. Sita Shiganti, professor of English at the University of California, Davis. Her most recent book, Strange Footing from 2018, examines the medieval dance of death and received the MLA Scalione Prize in Comparative Literary Studies. Her scholarship explores medieval poetry's relationship to other cultural arenas, from dance to devotional artifacts. She also writes for general audiences on whether and how medieval studies might resist white supremacy and promote racial justice both inside and outside the discipline. Dr. Shiganti will speak to us on Dance Macabre and the aftermath of pandemic. Sita. Thank you very much, Winston. And while I am getting my share screen ready, um, I will also take this opportunity to thank um, Monica for including me uh, in this conversation and Lisa for organizing it. Um, so I've got my share screen up. Is it visible to everybody? Yes, okay. Yes, Great. good. Yeah. Um, so uh, I am here to offer some thoughts about the extent to which plague and its aftermath affected late medieval art and culture. This is a challenging enterprise for reasons of both methodology and historical fact. We're familiar with death imagery in late medieval art, but we know as well that it was pervasive and not specific to plague. It originated well before the first major onset of plague in Europe in the mid 14th century, and in the 15th century, such art related to many other experiences of death beside plague. Uh, methodologically, meanwhile, and I'll just um, interject my, to myself here and say that Monica has uh, raised the theme of methodology in a really useful way in, in her talk and her work. Um, methodologically, I think it's worth our being as self-aware as we can about the limits of seeing one phenomenon to influence or bring about another. That kind of conventional causation in time should, I think, invite challenge and experimental alternatives. So in these remarks today, I'm not going to try to establish how the art or culture of the 14th and 15th centuries in Europe responded directly to plague. Rather, I want to ask what aspects of art might have intersected provocatively with experiences that plague and its aftermath created. To answer this question, I'm going to focus on the late medieval visual idiom of Danse Macabre, um, and while Dance Macabre itself might not depict an actual performance tradition, I'm understanding it here as speaking to a broader cultural familiarity with dance practice in Europe. Um, I'm going to argue in this presentation that the dance element of Dance Macabre offers unique ways to organize thoughts about plague and its aftermath, and in particular, the temporal experiences that pandemic creates. So I'm hoping that my talk will have some useful resonances with Nuket Varlix in particular. I found her work very helpful and generative um, in, in preparing these remarks. To begin, I'll provide some brief context for thinking about medieval art and plague. First are the complexities involved in trying to associate medieval death art specifically with plague. Some death art, like the tradition of the three living and the three dead, emerged decades before the mid 14th century outbreak of plague in Europe. Others, like the cadaver and transy tombs of the 15th century, developed after major outbreaks, but may also have reflected other preoccupations. One is the relationship of the material body to the soul, a shift in medieval thought that Caroline Walker Bynum and Christine Beckel have also discussed. 
Also, um, 15th century art that imagined the confrontation of the living with the dead, as Ashby Kinch notes, equally represents patronage situations that negotiate between secular aristocratic and religious power in regard to death. And as Sophie Oosterwick has argued, Parisian danse macabre may have gestured toward the deaths of important monarchs, as well as a sensitive political situation. So in addition to all this looseness of historical relation between plagues specifically and death imagery in art, it's also worth noting that the very tradition of scholarship connecting plague and art has itself interrogated the tactics by which we try to create causal relations between them. These questions arose in response to Millard Nisa's argument that post-plague art in Siena and Florence indicated a devout and conservative turn, a reaction to plague that paused the trajectory toward Renaissance humanism. Hank Banos suggests that arguments like Nisa's fail to take into account the alterity of medieval experience and visuality themselves, so that the measures by which we might determine the presence of plague in art or by which we might analyze changes in art as direct reactions to plague may not really represent a historical argument about the medieval on its own terms as we might wish it to. So in looking at Danse Macabre, I'm asking not about causality again, but rather how the element of dance in this idiom created a conceptual space in which to work out issues that mass death raised. One answer to that question involves an argument I made about medieval dance in my recent book, Strange Footing. I suggested here that the strange footing of medieval dance, um, and this is a term adapted from John Lydgate's 15th century dance macabre poem, Strange Footing, uh, was, an was an experience of disorientation and asynchrony within the apparent periodicity and harmony of many medieval dance forms. We can see this experience of irregularity and instability within regularity in this French book image with the chaos of sight lines that exists inside the ordered alternation of living and dead participants. Focusing on sight lines can indicate to us a sense of a kind of vertiginous movement that might occur within or be felt within an experience of dance, but that doesn't necessarily show itself when we are considering that dance more externally, looking at the ordered processional structure of Danse Macabre as a whole. That dynamic gets thrown into another dimension and intensified in this painting of a 15th century Danse Macabre mural set in a cloister site. And here is a detail of that, makes the mural clearer. The emphasis on danced movement, again, draws out these small disorientations in time and space within the ordered structure of the artwork. Alina Gertzman has observed that if someone were reading the poetic inscriptions that accompany the Danse Macabre picture, as you can see figures doing on the left side of the painting, that person would have to move left to right, which is the opposite direction in which the painted figures progress. So we can see that the mural encourages a kind of choreography that involves both the static painting and the moving people. But the presentation here also complicates and disrupts that shared dance-based momentum. The architectural features of the cloister interrupt it, send it around corners, throw off the dance's symmetry in the viewer's perceptual experience, another slightly off-kilter sightline. We might also recognize this dance macabre's attention to the suspensions that lie within the movement, the spaces between dancers, between the living and the dead, between spectators and dancers, and even here between the mural and the architecture. All these spaces hold forces of potential in this suspended time. Dance's sense of always impending movement that is at once inevitable and unknowable. I want to speculate that these features of Danse Macabre as a depiction of dance provide a window onto one experience of time in a situation of mass death. And I'll note here that from our perspective within COVID-19, the temporal destabilization at work in the medieval example becomes particularly clear. Repetition, the formal hallmark of Danse Macabre, emerges as a tyranny of recurrence, at once completely mundane and inevitable, and yet at the same time terrifying in the disruption that threatens to rear itself. This feeling, of course, is familiar to many people right now. And knowing it now might help us to understand or have some sense of why Danse Macabre became a popular genre in the century after the first major occurrences of plague in Europe. 
Dance Macabre may, as others have suggested, indicate simply a familiarity, a dread fascination with the dead body interspersed everywhere among the living. A long-term, but essentially direct traumatic response to plague. But Dance Macabre may also speak to something deeper and more intriguingly attenuated, the potential for the form of a familiar practice, dance, to communicate what time feels like in an aftermath that is also anticipatory. I'd emphasize that this brief reading not only recognizes a kind of temporal sensitivity within medieval experience, but also relies upon the further challenge to temporal order that happens when we enter the present pandemic into our interpretive loop. This move relates to my opening point about experimenting with the methodologies by which we try to learn about both plague and culture. And here I'm deliberately eschewing the attempt to reaccess the medieval on some sense of its own terms in favor of not only acknowledging, but also emphasizing and marshalling the inevitable interpretive role of the present when we read the medieval. My points about method and time support, as I alluded to earlier, um, Nuket Varlik's contention that to understand the plague globally requires interrogating our assumptions about how plague moves in time, how we deploy temporality when we think about plague, and how we should examine and even explode the methodologies by which we derive these historical insights. For example, um, as we saw in her presentation and also Monica's remarks earlier, the progression of plague phases understood for Europe does not necessarily map effectively onto a more global perspective on plague, which is another way of indicating how we need to think about the time of plague differently. And indeed, the methodological and temporal interrogations I've been discussing Sita, is that, are others experiencing that Sita has been cut off? Are you receiving audio? I'm not, I'm not hearing her either. No. Oh no! Um, when now we are. Now, now okay. I. Okay. Uh, should I go back or? Maybe a sentence or two. Okay. Uh, what was the what was the last thing you heard? <laughs> no, I can't remember. Probably about one minute was gone. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so let me see. Uh, oh gosh. Um, okay. So. Temporalities, I think, was. Yeah, okay. Um, well, okay, I'll just go back to the previous paragraph. So um, I'll, I'd emphasize that this brief reading not only recognizes temporal sensitivity within medieval experience, but also relies upon the further challenge to temporal order that happens when we enter the present pandemic into our interpretive loop. This move relates to my opening point about experimenting with the methodologies by which we try to learn about both plague and culture. I'm eschewing here the attempt to reaccess the medieval on some sense of its own terms in favor of not only acknowledging, but also emphasizing the inevitable interpretive role of the present when we read the medieval. My points about method and time support Nuket Varlik's contention that to understand plague globally requires interrogating our assumptions about how plague moves in time, how we deploy temporality when we think about plague, and how we should examine and even explode the methodologies by which we derive these historical insights. Um, and as Monica pointed out earlier, uh, and as Nuket Varlik has also written about, um, the progression of plague phases understood for Europe does not always effectively map onto a more global perspective on plague. So that's one example of how we need to kind of think about the time of plague differently. Um, and indeed, the methodological and temporal interrogations I've been discussing here might in the end allow Dance Macabre itself to support a more global perspective on plague. The word macabre, attested much earlier than the main artistic examples, has historically been insisted to have an uncertain etymology, despite what has always been a simultaneous recognition of its similarity to both Arabic and Hebrew words referring to tombs and grave diggers. What might changed ideas about the time of pestilence and its transmission tell us about the time of cultural and linguistic transmission regarding a heightened sensitivity toward death? So that's just one kind of provocation here. Um, when in John Lydgate's Dance Macabre poem, the merchant replies to death, he emphasizes the strange lands to which he has traveled, 
this word unites the sense of complicated temporal experience, the strange footing I described, and a spatial perspective that moves outside London, outside England possibly, and through other locales. So if European dance macabre illuminates the intricacies of moving through time in the wake of pandemic, perhaps that medieval cultural work can encourage us in the present to deploy a complex perspective on time that opens further the space of medieval pandemic. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sita. All right, our final speaker is Matthew Gabrielli on the subject of engaging with the Middle Ages in the modern world. Dr. Gabrielli is Professor of Medieval Studies and Chair of the Department of Religion and Culture at Virginia Tech. His research is focused on the intellectual and cultural worlds of the European Middle Ages from the 9th to the 12th centuries. He's also interested in modern memories of and nostalgia for the medieval world. And his writing on this has appeared in the Washington Post, Time, and Forbes. He's currently completing with David M. Perry of the University of Minnesota, a one volume rethinking of the medieval world for HarperCollins entitled The Bright Ages. Matt. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to, um, to, to Lisa and to Monica for, for organizing this. To all my panelists, I'm feeling deeply humbled to be a part of this. Um, I'm also kind of the odd duck in that my own research is not, not at all really related to, to the Black Death. Um, and so again, I'll, I'll keep my remarks relatively brief and just try to do some framing about the importance of this type of work, um, especially in, in, in moments of, of a particular crisis, like we find ourselves in this, this, this modern um, pandemic. Um, one of the things that, that I want to emphasize here is, is the importance of expertise in these conversations. Um, and in that, in that, one of the things that, that I think spurred this, this medieval webinar was that there are a lot of these kind of what I call rainbow connections that are being made in popular media, in which uh, what I mean by rainbow connection is this, this tendency to try to leap from the moment now back to some moment in the past, just kind of skipping over anything in between and see some sort of direct causal connection between then and now. So you see a lot of things about the Black Death changed Europe in this way and what will COVID do um, in this modern world, whether that's in an economic or political, cultural, religious sense or, or anything like that. Um, so, so I think it's important that, that again, that the Medieval Academy has agreed to put this on and to think about kind of the resources that, that are, are made available or that are out there and make sure that people are, are aware of those things. Um, one of the most, uh, most important resources that are out there are open access um, scholarly resources, not just um, what um, uh, Gerard mentioned uh, earlier with the Journal Afrique, but uh, volumes such as Monica Green's um, edited collection um, in the Medieval Globe, which is open access, and there it is right there. You can download the whole thing um, if you want from the, the, uh, uh, the site at Western Michigan University, the Medieval Globe. Um, but also, I think there's other, there's other forms of public scholarship as well, and things like, like I've done, things that people on this panel have done, things that many other um, humanists and social scientists have been doing as well as publishing in the popular, in the popular media. Uh, this is this is the type of work I think that that a lot of uh, scholars kind of shy away from, but I, I want to encourage people if they're comfortable doing so. And there's many reasons not to to want to put yourself out there um, in this particular way. But if they're comfortable doing so, is is being able to take a leap because this is the type of work that we as as teachers do every day in a classroom or nowadays on Zoom, I guess. Um, is this is a type of teaching, I think, is that communicating with a public who doesn't necessarily understand, uh, you know, precisely the, the, the parameters and bringing them along, making them kind of co-authors um, uh, co in, the, in the production of knowledge, um, in this case, particularly about the Black Death or, or in historical examples about, about global pandemics. My own experience with this has to do with the Crusades. My own research has to do a lot with religion and violence, uh, both theoretically, but also in the medieval context um, from the ninth through the 12th centuries. Um, the Crusades, of course, have been a hot topic for a long time from things uh, very recent, such as you may remember uh, just last year, uh, Donald Trump Jr. Uh, posting on Instagram his, his Crusader gun. And you can see right here, if you can see my, my picture down there, there's a, a, a uh, a Jerusalem cross right there, um, an image of a crusader knight, and then Hillary behind bars for, 
for reasons, I guess. Um, but even back further um, than that, back to 9-11, or even um, more recently, such as uh, recent terrorist attacks, such as that in 2017 at London Bridge, in which, if you remember, and I, there's a piece that's, that's on your screen right now from um, the Washington Post, which I published, um, which was accompanied by, after the terrorist attacks, a lot of right-wing politicians calling for new crusades or justifying or defending the crusades as unfinished business. And again, what I argue in that, in that piece there and what I've continued to argue is that that is what they're doing right there in, the, in that political moment is drawing this rainbow connection, is saying that this moment now is like that moment. Then we draw justification in our future actions by the actions of, um, in this case, medieval um, religious violence. Um, in those ways. Um, and that has a lot to do with the way that the Crusades have historically been taught. And I've encountered this in myself when I teach a, a very popular, well, like, relatively popular, I guess, course here at Virginia Tech on the Crusades, is every time I think about this, when I see a student in my class, and this happens every once in a while, with their laptops open in front of me in the classroom, and they have a militia sticker on their, on their, on their laptop that I can see, Right, like I have to think about the way that I'm presenting the material because I know why they're there. They're using it because they're interested in medieval history because of a particular understanding of the medieval world as, as white, as patriarchal, as homogenous, as, um, and, and it's something that can inform the world today back in 2017 about um, the struggle against ISIS before then about tali the Taliban or Al Qaeda or things like that. Justifying again, using then to justify actions now. And we've seen this even as recently, um, you know, through the, the events of the white supremacist rally at Charlottesville, even today, um, rallying cries of deus volt, God wills it, supposedly the rallying cry of the crusaders being repeated again and again and again. Um, even a conversation about the, one of the recent video games that's um, uh, one of the hotly anticipated video games that's coming out, Assassin's Creed Valhalla about the Vikings, again, a concern about white supremacist appropriation um, within that and in response to that as well. Um, and I think that's particularly important that, 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 that we as humanists, as social scientists, as, as experts in these fields engage, because one of the things that often happens in these moments of crisis, as happened when these conversations about crusades have come up, and as we're seeing right now in COVID-19, is that crisis leads to scapegoating, right? Is about uh, the blaming of um, particular groups of people um, in, um, in COVID-19, you know, the language of the quote-unquote Wuhan flu or something like that, the racist uh, provocations behind that, but then of course blaming the Jews as well, um, something that again kind of parallels um, as others um, who have done extensive work on this have shown is that massive violence that accompanied, um, the massive violence against the Jews that accompanied um, the arrival of the Black Death in certain European communities um, in Spain and, and France and, and places like that. All right. Um, so I think that that again, if I can can leave, um, it's um, one of the things that we can do in bringing these about is that we can bring nuance. And I think you've seen that here is that the simple um, narrative that's been so prevalent and it's still so so prevalent in the popular media today, as Monica pointed out at the very beginning, that New York Times article from just a week ago. Um, that there's a standard narrative about these things, but the, the history of the Black Death, for example, is, is incredibly complex. It's a global phenomenon. It's putting the pan uh, back in pandemic, as numerous um, scholars have pointed out as well, and as Sita just pointed out, is about being attentive to kind of the cultural um, implications of um, and the manifestations of, of um, cultural reactions to these types of crises, I think, are, are incredibly um, constructive. So I want to, again, I'll just kind of close. I'll, I'll, I'll thank the Medieval Academy for continuing to put these things on. And that there are um, opportunities for us in sort of subtle ways in order to make sure that we're, we're being attentive to our own expertise, to think about that, how we can contribute to these conversations. The conversations, I think, have been rightly um, pointing out, at least in, in thoughtful ways, the importance of epidemiologists, listening to epidemiologists, listening to, um, to experts on these types of things, but, but humanists and social scientists, I think, have a role to play as well. Um, and I think that we need to be there at the beginning of these conversations as much as possible, instead of kind of standing on the, uh, the platform yelling at the train as it's, as it's already departed the station. Um, one of the things that we historians do exceptionally well is we talk about how 
you know, standard understandings of the past are not simple, that these were humans back then, that they were, com they were, they were complex, there were problems, they, were, they wrestled with things, that they thought, they lived, they breathed, they lived in color and not in some sort of caricature of black and white. And what that ultimately does, what hum the humanities and social sciences do ultimately, is we show that things didn't have to turn out today the way they did, um, the way they ultimately did. And that ultimately opens up possible worlds, not just for the people of the past who didn't live in, in a line, but for perhaps today as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Matt, for those sobering and uh, vitally important reminder of the role of humanists in providing the social context for pandemics. So we're now going to return to uh, Dr. Monica Green for some final summary remarks uh, before we open up for questions and answers. Monica? Hello. Um, actually, I'm. Uh, this has been so rich and, and also so complex um, that I'm going to uh, cede my, um, uh, my time right now and, and turn us directly to questions. So if you wanna go ahead and, and get us started with those, Winston, that would be- Sure, yeah, I'd be glad to. Uh, so we, we have a, an embarrassment of riches here. The questions have been pouring in on Twitter, so I'm doing my best to uh, work through them here. But one stands out uh, to me that will get you, Monica, to talk anyway here at the start. Uh, but a great question, uh, it's directed both to you, Monica, and to Nukat, but I think um, anyone can come in on this. Uh, it's from Martha Newman. Uh, she asked, Monica Green's slide of rats suggests a continuity of symptoms and that we can use modern studies to understand medieval disease. Nuket Varlik suggests that we should be open to historical influences on the expressions of the disease, including climate, ecology, changes in hosts, and changes in vectors. How do we balance this? Oh, actually, I, I consider it very easy. Um, so the, the reason that I showed that, that slide is we need to inform ourselves as historians about a past that the people who lived it themselves didn't see. Um, that sounds a little more complicated than it, it, it needs to, but I... We have, I grew up in, in a generation of historians of Madison who said, thou shalt not do retrospective diagnosis. Um, thou shalt not take modern categories of disease and modern explanations of disease and apply them to a past where the people themselves didn't think these ways. They didn't see microbes. They didn't think about the... Um, uh, the possibilities that 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 rats or other rodents might have been um, carrying uh, around the disease, and it and it was literally verboten. This is like you know that that a responsible historian of medicine just does not do that. And I was living with an exasperation throughout my career. Most of most of my career, as as you know, I spent working on texts talking about women's medicine, and that is a field. Um, for which we still have very little ways of, of determining uh, in a, a concrete physical way what women actually suffered from. Um, because most gynecological obstetric problems happen to soft tissues of the body and they simply decay. They're gone. Um, it was a revelation to me to realize that pa uh, paleopathologists could look at a skeleton, or the, the hard tissue that survives, and determine if someone had a very severe case of leprosy. Um, naively, and this is how little I knew about paleopathology at the time, I assumed, okay, well, now they're gonna do plague next. And um, uh, I, I, I got <laughs> abraded on, on um, that foolishness and was told paleopathology by itself will never document plague because paleopathology documents changes to the bone and plague kills too quickly to produce any changes in the bone. Um, so that's where the um, paleogenetics came in. And I had no idea it was coming down the pike. It was a big revelation. 
um, uh, to me when I started hearing about it. Mike McCormick at Harvard was the visionary um, uh, in all of this, and Lester Little um, in seeing these trends very, very early that were um, happening with, with the microbiologists. Okay, so that, that brings us back to that, that, the slide about the mouse um, that, that um, was being studied. Um, we have to start with what we know. And that's what biologists are doing is we know um, uh, for, from a variety of different reasons that rodents are the main hosts um, for plague. But what is also apparent is that there's a variety of other animals that, that might be carrying uh, and, and moving plague around. Um, uh, the biggest one that, that needs uh, still massive research is camels. Um, and so that, that may be the factor, the, the key factor in moving plague across the Sahara. It's certainly a big factor in moving it across major um, desert landscapes in, um, uh, in central Eurasia. Um, so I see um, my embrace of the modern science as very much, in fact, entirely akin uh, with what Nuket is proposing is that we have to broaden our horizons. Um, we start with what we know, but then let's push beyond it. Let's read the records. Let's take seriously um, uh, the implications of what it means that, you know, an entire village um, was sickened because they, they ate contaminated camel meat. Um, we need to research camels. How much um, are people in the Middle Ages um, eating, eating camel meat? And frankly, there's a, I, I don't know if, if, if you recall, my, my opening slide, I didn't have time to explain it, but I had a picture of rats in boats. Um, and that's from a non-plague um, context, but that symbolizes for me where we are in terms of the still massive question of mechanism of transmission. It can be rats in boats. Um, as, as, as far as I know, that is, um, that is moving play around. So anyway, I'll turn this over to, to Nuket for, for her response. Okay, very, very quickly. Yes, it's the gerbil. Add, can you see the gerbil that I'm showing now? Yes, I was gonna yeah. ask you to put that up. <laughs> yeah. So just very quickly to add, I mean, of course, I agree with everything Monica just said, uh, but to in uh, just to little complicate the rodents category that we ta we're talking about in terms of plague history a little further. Yes, rats, obviously, black rats and brown rats, and historically, these have been among the stars of plague historiography. Yes, but we need to also think about the role of the wild rodents because those are more likely as, or at least as important as, uh, important as uh, rats to maintain as reservoir species long-term um, in, in the wild uh, rodent reservoirs, right? Uh, so so the, if, if the rodents are more uh, resistance, resistant to uh, the infection, they tend to um, sustain the infection over longer uh, time. And here I am just hoping that this is one of the likely actors, uh, one of the uh, rodent uh, species that uh, was responsible for the maintenance of plague in the Ottoman Empire. And again, I'm, I'm still working on it, but just to, to um, diversify the, the species of rodents. We're not only talking about rats, but we're also talking about um, a variety of rodents. And, and one other thing that, uh, just to um, add on to what Nuket has said, and one of the questions that Nuket is, is starting to ask is, some of these species may now be extinct because of plague. That, that we don't, we, they haven't been on our agenda because in fact, the, 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 um, those animals themselves got completely wiped out um, by this. So there's a lot, there's an absolute lot that we have to still keep investigating. And again, and I think that, that we have so many allies in the scientists um, who are ready and eager um, to, to ask these questions as well. It's, um, it's quite amazing the moment that we're at with the, um, the talent that is coming into this field. Okay, thank you. Uh, a lot of people are really interested in the epidemiology of plague and in animal hosts and insect vectors. And if we could just add a little bit more to this uh, discussion here, see a great question came in from Maggie Fritz Morkin, 
recording a seven-year-old's question. How can people get plague from marmots? Did marmots live in their cities? Oh, do you want me to take that? Or, yeah, uh, sure, marmots. <laughs> and and uh, Bob may, may have some comments on this yeah. too. Um, this is well documented in our um, uh, medieval sources. We are, um, in some respects, we don't have a fraction of this, the sources that, that we want, but in other ways, um, there's an abundance. Um, the um, Mongols are reported by um, outside observers as uh, consuming a variety of rodents um, as, as a protein source. Um, marmots are one of the largest rodents in the world. Um, uh, they're an excellent source of fat. They hibernate um, uh, uh, during the winter, so they build up a lot of fat. They have um, wonderful fur, um, and marmot fur is, well, I don't know if it's still being um, uh, 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 sold, but um, for, for centuries, marmots um, have been a major source of fur. They also use marmots to process um, the skin into a particular kind of leather that is said to be waterproof. Um, so eating marmots, um, uh, 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 eating them for the, the, the fat, eating them for the meat, um, and then using the, the fur and then using the leather. Um, it's a multiple use um, uh, animal uh, for, for the Mongols. So um, the point is, is that um, if you happen upon a marmot that is infected, all of these possibilities in catching it, slaughtering it, um, the fur might carry the dung of the fleas. So we, we talked about the um, fleas as being transmitters too. Um, so that might harbor the, the bacterium for a certain amount of time. Um, so yes, um, it's, and again, these are one of the ways in which we have to do the work to document this. Um, uh, and that, uh, the, the seven year old's question is absolutely excellent. Yeah. Um, that's, that, those are the kinds of, of questions we have to ask. Okay, good, thank you. Um, Here's a good question for Gerard here um, from Rachel Singer. Uh, here, a question balancing uh, historical sources, biology, and archaeology. She asks, Ibn Khatib claims in his plague treatise that nomadic Saharan Berbers did not contract plague during the Black Death. Doesn't that make transmission across the Sahara less likely? Thoughts on that, Gerard? Um, it, it's, it's complicated. It, it is true that uh, if we look at um, sources uh, from the Maghreb uh, or the Arab world in general concerning Africa in the 14th century, there is no mention of uh, Africa as a place where uh, plague uh, was a problem. Um, the, what we have is uh, Ibn Khaldun, for instance, saying uh, uh, the plague spread to the whole world. Now, did he include Africa in his definition of the whole world or not? That's uh, open to uh, interpretation. Uh, but um, it, it's, it's difficult to infer from one particular source talking about one particular population living in the Sahara um, of a situation of a count, I mean, of West Africa is, is basically, uh, I mean, you, you, could, uh, you could put the United States of America in West Africa. It's a, it's a very large territory. Um, so it's difficult to, to, you know, to infer a kind of, uh, a, a make a general statement out of one uh, isolated source. Um, now it's, you know, it's, it's also possible that uh, some populations were much less affected by others uh, by these disease and and possibly uh, Berber nomads uh, living in parts of the Sahara. Once again, I mean, there is no, I, I can't really address this question because we, we 
we are not yet at a point where we can uh, get into this level of details. I mean, right now, as you can see, I mean, what is very striking in this discussion is the distance that there is between, you know, scholarships uh, in different parts of the world, you know, as um, uh, people are um, on one side building very elaborate narrative about the reception of the plague uh, in a particular society, others are still struggling to uh, build up uh, evidence for it to exist uh, in other society. So there is, a, there is really a, a, a huge distance. What I could say is that um, we have many evidence which are not coming from the outside of Africa, but which are uh, build up in Africa, and these are archeological sources, uh, telling us a very different narrative than what these uh, uh, writers uh, is telling us. And also, um, we have to be careful of the chronology once again. I mean, this is something that has uh, come uh, over and over uh, uh, among the panelists is we need to pay attention to time. And, you know, um, uh, from what we understand so far from our archaeological uh, understanding of uh, what's going on in West Africa, um, the plague would not have had the same kind of chronological um, duration than it had uh, in the Ottoman Empire or other parts of the world. I mean, what we think happened in West Africa in particular is that the plague came as a fire. Uh, it burned, it destroyed uh, possibly uh, the uh, rodent infrastructure that uh, carried the plague along and disappeared quite quickly because there is no much evidence of plague um, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. There might be uh, some references in some sources uh, around the, uh, the, the Niger Valley uh, in the 16th, 17th century. But uh, other than that, uh, it's very striking that uh, European travelers in the Gulf of Guinea, for instance, are very clear that uh, there is no plague in these lands. Um, so it, we have to imagine that the, uh, the history of plague, the natural history of plague in, 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 in West Africa or in Africa or in different parts of Africa might have been quite different. And I would like to add something on the rodent uh, part of it because we, uh, we have a rodent uh, specialist in our group, which is something I think really important. And I know Monica <laughs> is going to be very happy about that. Uh, <laughs> because, um, because we, you know, we don't know much and, 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 and the, 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 the knowledge is, is usually from the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, it has not really been uh, 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 revisited uh, for a very long time. And since West Africa is, is not currently uh, a place where plague occur, there's not much interest in, in, in looking at these questions. But there is a very simple question that is emerging, I think, from the research of those doing uh, this type of work is that they see that the black rat is coming into West Africa in the 15th century, all right? Does it come because of the arrival of uh, the opening of the Atlantic trade? Does it come uh, through uh, the maritime uh, commerce or do they come also because um, maybe there's been some changes in the rodent infrastructure uh, in West Africa and they are able to carve out for themselves an ecological niche into this mm -hmm. uh, a region which has been transformed uh, yeah. Uh, from a rodent perspective. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Uh, could I could I just put in? Am I 
unmuted. Yeah, um, just one addition on the seven-year-old's question about marmots and how one would get a plague from a, a marmot. Um, marmot uh, fleas live their whole lives on marmots. They reproduce on the marmot. Um, they eat on the mar feed on the marmot. Their babies, their larvae, who hatch from their eggs, um, hatch on the in the marmot for and mature to adult fleas on the same marmot. And it's not clear, um, it's been a, an issue for me, it's not clear that a marmot flea would naturally in the normal course of events um, leave a marmot and bite a human. Well, it might, but it ne wouldn't necessarily be the most natural thing for it to do. Human fleas are very different uh, because we don't have fur um, of the same kind. Human fleas lay their eggs which drop off the person they're on and they land on the substrate, whatever it may be, a floor, the ground, whatever. Um, so I have a picture in my head that I would love to get a flea researcher I interested in working on, um, which is if you bring marmot furs or other kinds of furs that might be carrying um, flea feces, the bodies of dead fleas, the eggs of fleas, all of which would be on, in marmot fur, and you have a human being who's got a flea um, and he's living above or on these marmot furs, using them for carpets and that sort of thing, and his flea lays its eggs and they drop off him and they land in the marmot fur. Um, fleas, I think all fleas, but definitely human fleas, um, the, the larvae eat the feces of previous fleas, they eat the dead bodies of previous fleas, and they eat the eggs of previous fleas. This is how flea larvae live and mature. Um, so you'd have a situation there where a, hu where a human flea larva would, might be living in the substrate, namely a rug made out of marmot fur, and eat the remnants left behind by previous fleas, which would be marmot fleas. And what I would love to know is if a larva of a fl human flea can carry, can live through the experience of acquiring the plague bacillus through eating and then mature into an adult flea, which would then be able to bite a human. Then they, you know, they leave the substrate and they, they look for a human to land on and bite. Um, and they live the rest of their life as adults on that human generally. Um, so it's a means, a possible means of transmission that I don't know, I don't know the reality of, because I don't know if a larva can acquire the bacillus and carry it to adulthood. But if it could, it would be actually a very interesting and natural way for the process to take place of getting the thing from a marmot, let's say, to a human being. Uh, thanks Bye. for that, Bob. As, as you were talking, uh, there's a good comment that came in from uh, medieval rats on Twitter. That's uh, David Orton. <laughs> Uh, zooarchaeologist at York, mm -hmm. uh, noting that marmots have often been hunted and used by people rather than living in towns, yet we don't find their bones all that often in historical period sites. So, I mean, it's a, it's a negative evidence, but I think it, it's just providing some interesting complications there. Is yeah, that I, think don't think, I don't think the marmots, the, any marmots that were associated with Mongols would have, um, you know, come with the Mongols and lived in the cities. Um, yeah. I've never heard of a marmot. Marmots are underground dwellers. They make huge networks of burrows. Um, a, a Mongol might carry a pet marmot along or carry marmots along to kill later for food and fur, but I don't think they would end up in the city. Um, so I think yeah, the transfer would have to be probably by other rodents or person-to-person -person contact via, via human fleas or other, other fleas. Um, a groundhog is a tip pretty typical marmot, except that it's non-colonial. And you don't find a lot of groundhogs in, um, you know, even the the cities of even the states where where groundhogs live in this yeah. country. Um, Anne Carmichael brought up an example in her piece on plague persistence in the 2014 volume mm -hmm. uh, of uh, marmots, alpine marmots, being brought into the city for entertainment. Yes. So they, they, they don't mind hanging out with human beings. There's a lovely picture um, online somewhere of some Sichuanese. Um, Soldiers, I think they are feeding lettuce to marmots and playing with them um, in the in the in the mountains, in the, the Sichuanese branch of the Himalayas, basically, um, which is something I would never do, but they, they seem to be doing okay with it. Um, and the marmots were very happily interacting with them. Uh, Buffon says that the naturalist, 18th century French naturalist, says that um, marmots brought into the household will basically take it over and scare away the other pets um, and dominate the household from that point of view. But I think it was a you know a niche. Uh, form of petdom, basically, not, not all that common. Sure, okay. Um, turning direction a little bit here, there's a number of questions coming in for 
Is Sita still here or did she leave? Oh dear, I think she left. Any sign of her? I think we lost one of our panelists. Um, yeah, I think she stepped she away. Had, I'll, I'll... She had a family uh, emergency and had to leave us. Oh, okay, sorry to hear that. Okay, um, well hopefully uh, she can maybe answer those for people on, on Twitter. Uh, but I'll come back to a broader question here, um, somewhat related to uh, the question that was for uh, Gerard, um, we're looking at these issues of exploring uh, introduction of plague into areas where he hadn't previously studied it. Um, Ruth Mostern asks, and this could be for anybody here, what is known about the Black Death in South Asia? It looks like a no plague zone on maps I've seen, but that doesn't seem plausible. Anybody? It's a great question to which I would love to know the answer also. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've got uh, Europe, I, we've got well, Africa. Yeah. The mysterious blank, yeah. I should say that the, the work I did trying to, uh, first of all, I, I have no languages um, to, to pursue the, the question myself. So um, I was working with, with um, materials that are available in translation um, and also working through the whether there was a genetic trace that could be um, determined. And the only genetic trace that I found, and, the, and which also corresponds with the only historical information um, I have, is that plague cannot be documented um, in India, or let me say post-Black Death um, plague cannot be documented in, in India until the uh, early 17th century. Um, and that um, fits with what I understand of, of the genetics now that basically there's a, a lineage of, of plague that kind of goes from, from Kyrgyzstan, it goes kind of in a north-south um, trajectory. And that gets down into India and, it's, and it remains in, in northern India now. Um, I would love to see, and this is one of the things that I think might come from the, uh, the Institut Pester Cartopest study is I would love to see a lot more samples of plague from India because uh, I assume they are, they are in the, uh, the, the archives of the Institute Pasteur. Um, right now, I think we only have maybe two genome sequences of, of plague from, from India. Um, so basically, we're, we're working in, in ignorance. Um, these these um, would be third pandemic samples, probably, Monica, because certainly it was in India. Some, yes, there is there are third pandemic um, samples, but in terms of of uh, any of the other lineages, mm -hmm. uh, there's only one or two that have been sequenced. Um, so I I think that's a question, and then then the question would be why if it's moving through the Mongol Empire, um, uh, and it doesn't necessarily reach all the parts of the Mongol Empire, but um, I think it's, it's, it's fairly broad. And uh, I can't um, uh, mention this research, but, but uh, in private conversations, I've had indications from people working on Japan, we, people working on Tibet, um, that they are suspecting plague also in those areas. Um, so why didn't it get to, um, to, to India? Um, because there's certainly you know, plenty of traffic um, that could have moved it down there. Um, I simply don't know, and I don't know if Monica, it did you're, move. you're cut off, at least as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I still here? here? I can hear you. Yes. Um, Maybe I'm cut off. Anyway, the, I'll, I'll just say um, quickly that um, it's a puzzle to me. I mean, in the same way um, uh, Gerard mentioned, if it didn't get to Africa, that in itself is a question, and that's the way I feel about India if it didn't get to India in this um, uh, period of intense um, a movement of people, intense movement of, of goods, and then um, the, the beginning of really major climatic change, um, why didn't it move? Okay, thanks for that. Um, I've got a series of questions here on a number of people interested in the nature of the human hosts of the Black Death, uh, essentially questions of demography here. See if I can synthesize them here uh, from Lynn Arner, Dr. von Weisenberg, and Chris Atwood. But um, asking, are disparities in death rates 
tie to socioeconomic status or um, someone brings up also uh, Sharon DeWitt's and Philip Slavin's piece about protein deficiencies related to severity of plague. And more broadly, uh, Chris Atwood interested in um, the question of why does the second pandemic seem to have been uh, the worst of the plague pandemics? Is there something about receptivity, vulnerability of populations in the 14th century? So I think all of those overlap, essentially, what, what's wrong with people in the 14th century? What's going on in their bodies? Well, I'll go back to my rats and ships. <laughs> <laughs> of, uh, there may be multiple mechanisms of transmission. Um, and I think that's, that's something um, uh, that, and, an issue, a blank in our narratives that we're just going to have to sit with uncomfortably because there is, as far as I'm concerned, there's no explanation that covers everything. So certain um, ports, so I'm going to be making an argument about uh, the role of grain shipments. Um, Hannah Barker has made the, the argument about the role of grain shipments. And that makes sense in terms of getting plague to Italy because they have famine and they're, 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 they're really desperate to import grain um uh at that point but how do you get from the mediterranean to northern europe um they won't be importing grain or they won't be importing it from those sources um i think um uh, that's my biggest question is instead of saying um uh, are are people differently protected in terms of their immune response are they differently protected simply in, in their exposure to the, uh, to the organism? Um, I have been keeping a running list of, of um, nobility, uh, for example, who are, are reported to have succumbed to the plague. And it's actually a very short list, um, at, at least for the 14th century. Um, what is it? Um, about their um, their lifestyle is it because they have bigger homes that they um, uh, there's not as many fleas um, uh, Guido Alfani who is one of our Twitter consult um, uh, people a historian of of uh, economics has done amazing work with uh, 17th century evidence where the, the 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 documentation is simply much richer for a variety of, of reasons. And an amazing study he did of the Italian city of Nonantola, showing that um, uh, it, it basically, he had the ability to go virtually house by house of documenting plague mortality and showed that for houses where um, there were 12 people in a household, 16 people in a household, very high mortality rates. Um, as opposed to um, other households that that probably just had more space um, that um, or or maybe didn't have to keep their animals in the house with them because they um, uh, they had separate you know pig styes or or whatever. So there's a huge number of questions um, about exposure um, and then questions uh, which are also 100% legitimate to ask about um, uh, differences in vulnerability. Okay, thank you. Um, do any of the speakers have questions for each other? I'll let you think on that one. I've got a whole lot more questions from the audience here. Now we've been focusing uh, naturally on the Black Death and primarily in the 14th century, but Nuket has taken us up to the 20th century. But Bailey Poletti asks, I think a very good question here. Can someone speak more directly to the seeming absence of plague between the seventh and 13th centuries and work done on that front, perhaps globally? Why did it not remain an endemic after the Justinian plague, the first pandemic, like it was after the Black Death? Mm. Um, I, this is where I, <laughs> I wish we had all of our, our Twitter consults kind of in the room with us. Um, now, an amazing finding 
uh, from the two most recent major um, paleogenetic studies. So this is Keller et al. Um, 2019 and Spiru et al. Um, 2019. So one on the Justinianic plague um, and, and one on second pandemic in Europe. And what they found was um, a, a genome late in the Justinianic plague and a genome late in the second pandemic in Europe, both had the exact same defect or, or deletion in the genome. And this is simply stunning. Um, uh, this is simply stunning that, that completely separately, there's, there's, um, there's simply no, well, I suppose there's, there's some um, biological, um, uh, uh, possibility to explain it, but basically we have to assume that this these are um, separate phenomena that got repeated. And the question then is, why would that same part of the genome get lost two different times? And one answer might be that um, when plague moves through a certain host, there's something about the the, the chemistry, the biology of that host that um, you know. Uh, contributes to the deletion of, of, of that part of the, the genome or something. Anyway, I'm not, this is where we need our biologists um, uh, to come in and, and do an analysis for us. But, the, the, so the question that's on the table, is there something about plague, about Yersinia pestis that is actually dying, that it's an, actually a dying organism? Um, one, Immediate answer to that is um, if you look at the plague of Marseille in 1720 to 22, it's still lethal to humans. Um, that's for sure. Um, but is it killing off its rodent host as well? So it no longer has, um, uh, cause that's how it has to main, be maintained is it, it's gotta be living somewhere between the human outbreaks. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, um, it's a major question. The other answer to that though, is that that also, the, the idea that plague disappeared for three, 400 years is also, a, um, is also drawn from, from uh, European records. If you look at the Middle East, if you look at North Africa, if you look at Syria, there are indications of plague remaining. Um, now, in no case do we have any uh, ADNA to confirm any of this, um, the 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 uh, historical records themselves, I think, need to be gone back and and uh, scrutinized all over again. Um, but I don't. I think our our traditional ending date for the Justinianic plague needs to be questioned. Um, it it might have uh, plague might have persisted, or the other possibility is there might have been new waves of plague. Um, uh, we usually see just circa 750 for the end of the first yeah. pandemic, and that's just exactly. sort of like a rug. <laughs> it just exactly. disappears from the record. Yeah. I was cut off for a while and just managed to get back on shortly ago, so um, I, I missed the actual question, but if it's a question of, if part of the question is on the le current lethality and whether the plague might, bacillus might be using up its host organisms, in, in China, in Gansu and, and Qinghai, um, this is still how one reads of the occasional case of plague and of them shutting down, quarantining a, a city because somebody has hunted and eaten or bought and eaten a marmot. Um, so it certainly still seems to be, um, you know, vibrant and vital in the marmot populations in that part of the world. Um, also, um, somebody did a wonderful study testing um, a village of Mongolians known to be marmot hunters um, for uh, plague antibodies and found that something, some very high percentage of the ma males of the men in the village had, um, had plague antibodies in their blood, um, which meant that they had contracted cases. These are guys often who dose themselves up heavily on antibiotics before they go out and hunt, a pla hunt marmots um, because they know about plague in the marmots. Um, the problem is that um, this is a good way of developing um, antibiotic resistant strains, of course, but, although that hasn't happened in China yet, apparently. But, um, but it seems to be doing well in the marmot population up there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you made it back, Bob, because there's actually a wide range of questions for you. Some of them are, I think, quick business-related ones. Um, 
One person wondering, will your hand-drawn map that you mentioned be in any of your upcoming publications? Yes, although I don't know how upcoming the publication will be. I'm finishing, I'm finishing that article now um, in, in uh, semi-quarantine on Cape Cod um, without full access to everything I might want to use to draw maps, but I'll, I'm going to be uh, producing those, I hope, in the next month or so and submitting the article to, um, to one or another journal. And so, you know, maybe in a year or two, um, people will be able to see those maps, yes. Great, and in a related question, uh, at Pilgrim Chick asks, would it be possible to share the Chinese characters for the term you believe refers to a plague bubo? Yes, um, what, I, certainly, but what medium would I use to do that? Put them in chat or, I don't, I'm not on Twitter. Yeah, um, um, do those appear in your 2014 piece? Ye, uh, yes. Yeah, I think we could, uh, we've already put up links to, um, yeah, uh, Good yeah, uh, yeah. in the chat that actually is the last post here is to the 2014 pandemic um, uh, volume that has your piece. So yeah, that they can Good. find yes, it. It's there. available there. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think more specific uh, questions uh, to what you were talking about, um, uh, someone asks, Chinese sources indicate a spike in epidemics in the 1210s to 1230s. Were they plague? Um, um, those, those are the ones, those are indeed the ones that I'm, uh, that have been, largely been working on, although they continue through the, through the 13th century to some degree, but the ones in the 1210s to 1230s are thereabouts, are the ones I've been working on in the, in the work I was describing. Um, and I, my argument is that they were plague. I mean, uh, you know, I, I really feel that this question for China particularly will be answered in, in a truly demonstrative way only when somebody digs out a DNA out of the teeth of somebody from a mass burial outside of Kaifeng or another one of these cities. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I think the evidence is pretty good that it probably was plague that was um, going on in those, in those epidemics, yeah. Yeah, this uh, poster, um, uh, John, someone uh, said, uh, notes that across the 1200s, categories of epidemics that had been previously known suddenly add large sores to lists that's, of symptoms. That's a, uh, virtually a quote from what I said. Okay. Is there a question <laughs> that goes with that or? So sounds yeah, like, they, they might be getting it from you. Okay. Yeah, sounds like he's read my paper. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, here's a question here uh, for you, Nuket. Um, uh, more of a, an observation, but hopefully something you can comment on. Uh, Sarah Butterfoss Schleep says, the temporal extent discussed by Dr. Varlick makes me wonder how temperature affects spread, incubation, and persistence of plague events. Right. I mean, absolutely great question. And that's why I try to emphasize that it's important to pay attention to local contexts. And again, if we're talking about something as large as the Ottoman Empire, historically speaking, you know, at its height, extending from Southeast Europe to the Persian Gulf, from Western um, end of the North Africa to the Black Sea, again, we're talking about a large, large area. So it's important to pay attention to the particularities of different locations within the empire, right? So temperature, definitely an important factor. So for instance, when I look at the beginning and end of um, recurrent outbreaks during the second pandemic in the Ottoman Empire. For instance, in Istanbul, they would start much later than in, say, Cairo, right, or Damascus. So there is, in terms of temporality, you know, in addition to the larger temporality context we talked about, there's also, um, uh, it's, it's important to pay attention to the local context and temperatures change. Uh, and also um, uh, fauna and uh, flora. Uh, so the ecological context is also important. So you don't always find the same species of rodents or the same species of, of other mammals that are um, involved in the transmission of plague in, in different regions. For instance, uh, Monica earlier up, uh, brought up the importance of camels in the transmission of, 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 of plague, for instance. That would be more applicable to certain contexts that, you know, within the context of the Ottoman Empire, of course, but not everywhere. So yes, temperature is important in, in the tem temporality, but also um, ecological context, generally speaking, very important. So paying attention to local context is extremely important. You get, when do the outbreaks start in those various cities? What sort of range of, um, you know, months for the start? Right. 
um, for instance, in, in Cairo or in, in, in Damascus, you find typically outbreaks starting in mid-January or so. So the temperatures are just warm enough to trigger. I mean, as you know, very typically, and uh, you know, when you look at the, the, um, the slow progression of the outbreaks, of course, the curve is kind of slow in the beginning. You sure. have smaller numbers of that. And then it peaks in the late, um, late spring into summer in, in the southern climes. But in, uh, for instance, when I compare it to uh, the case of Istanbul, well, most typically, I would say mid-March to uh, mid-April would be the onset of the outbreak. Yeah. And it would peak later, um, later in the spring and early in summer, so May, June. Mm -hmm. And then July and August, typically it kind of declines because it's too hot for mm -hmm. the transmission, you know, and the fleas that are already infected will lose their infectivity when it's above 27 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. So, right. Uh, so, but, you know, in some cases you see that decline, again, more, like more typically in Istanbul, um, end of summer, well, late August would be basically the end even if it's a larger outbreak, but in some cases you see a later spike in the fall, uh, typically in October and November. And mm -hmm. so I am entertaining the possibility that those later spikes in the fall might be at least partly caused by pneumonic spread, though mm -hmm. I have no evidence to prove that. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, Gerard. Yes, we've talked about the temperature. I was wondering if you have uh, any correlation with rains or humidity in, in general, but rains in particular. Look at. Right. I mean, again, uh, I, I haven't done the work to make those correlations, but I am under the impression that, um, first of all, we need to think about altitude, right? That is something that's definitely going to uh, affect not only temperatures, but also rainfall. And I think there, it is, there, I see at least that this may be possible to study. You know, if you bring in the endocrinologist on board and uh, other paleoclimatologists, it should be possible to think about those correlations, right? And also to identify whether we see plague starting in the same season with the highlands and the lowlands. And my impression, again, on the basis of uh, historical sources, there's a difference. So, um, and again, in the Ottoman Empire, most typically, at least until the late 16th century or so, we see the continuation of semi-nomadic uh, semi lifestyle, at least in Anatolia. So people moving from the lowlands to the highlands in the summer, and then going back to um, the lowlands, right, to get the end of the summer. So in this pattern, you know, it will be interesting to think, like, you know, whether plague occurs at the same time in the lowlands and the highlands. And we have evidence that it was already occurring in the lowlands. And in fact, even the local tribes in Anatolia had a term uh, that they used that it was time to leave for the highlands. And it was the, the it means that there, there's an abundance of fleas. But so the locals already had that knowledge. Um, yeah, but the rainfall, I mean, I think we need to do more research to be able to, to uh, see those patterns more clearly. Okay, thank you, Nuket. Okay, we're getting close to our extended uh, finish time of 4.30. Uh, in a moment, I'd like to hand it over uh, to Monica for some um, final comments, but uh, I'd like to extend one question uh, final here to Matt. Um, uh, since a lot of your work has been attuned especially to uh, abuses and co-opting of crusade imagery and other medieval imagery. Uh, what do you think we need to be on the watch for or just uh, cognizant of in um, people's understanding or misunderstanding of the Black Death today? Yeah, no, I think that's 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 a critically important question, and I think the the biggest thing that we can do, um, I don't know if this is this is something that we need to necessarily watch out for, is is to make sure that, that we're we're being honest about the past. I think one of the things that that 
that people who are nostalgic for a medieval past or want to to deploy it in a particular way for specific political ends do is they want to to efface complexity they want they want to make it seem extremely simple is that there's a really straightforward narrative the the black death means this it did this to society it originated here it's their fault whatever whoever they are um <laughs> And um, therefore, we can take this lesson now to, 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 to make a political or a social or um, um, a cultural decision, whether that's, that's here in the US or in the UK or in Europe or, or kind of wherever. Um, so I think that, that those types of things, anytime that you see something deployed without, I don't want to say without nuance, but just in, in which they, they portray a, a necessarily comp incredibly, as we've seen today, an incredibly complex topic as something that's very simple to understand. Um, then, then I think that that should that should kind of raise the, the hairs on the back of our necks. That's not to say that you know there isn't incredibly wonderful scholarship that that the people in this seminar and many others out there are doing in order to explain a very complex topic in a digestible way that's different than than again kind of making sure that that something seems incredibly simple and, and, and straightforward so so i think those are the types of things and, and you've seen those i think with um, with covid 19 these 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 um these kind of think pieces that appear in which um, a, a very, at least to me, transparent kind of political or um, agenda is being advanced in order to make a point about now, but just using a straw man of the past in order to justify the position that they're, they're trying to do right now. So. Okay, thank you. All right, Monica, uh, would you be able to say a few comments uh, to pull everything together? Um, first of all, thanks to everyone. Thanks to um, the participants who have joined us, thanks to uh, Lisa and the staff of the Medieval Academy for sponsoring this. Um, I mean, literally, this was turned on a dime um, to, to bring all of this, this together. Um, but on the one hand, it also um, reflects really deep and long conversations that all of us have been having um, in, in small groups with one another um, uh, collectively um, to ask these questions um, uh, and, and to, to work through things that make us uncomfortable. And so I was telling um, uh, before about my discomfort at my own discipline of history of medicine telling me um, that I can't ask questions about diseases in the past. And this has been liberating for me. Um, this experience of being able to say leprosy is leprosy, plague is plague, tuberculosis is tuberculosis. Um, there are ways in which um, we will have to nuance um, uh, simple stories, but the kinds of things that we can tell now, have, we've never been able to tell before. Um, and, and new things will, will keep coming available. So I'm incredibly beholden to the geneticists who have done this pioneering work, who just stopped being, stopped waiting around for the historians, you know, with our empty speculation of maybe it's this and maybe it's that. And um, I mean, this is um, other groups of historians and not, not so much necessarily historians of medicine who were speculating about the cause of, of the Black Death. That's a done deal. It's not a question um, uh, anymore. But look at all these new questions that we have. Um, look at the ways I've been able to create dialogues um, with Bob about his evidence from China and with Gerard um, in his evidence um, uh, from, uh, from Africa. It's an amazing time. And the other thing that I would like to say is that I've, um, I, I taught my first course on the Black Death in 2012. I had been resisting teaching about the Black Death for most of my career, precisely because it seemed to be a black hole of you can't answer the question of what it was and therefore you can't you know, ask about, okay, how is it being spread or where is it coming from? It, it, it was hopeless. And um, uh, so I uh, first put together my course, but I did that in 2012 after I had twice taught the NEH summer seminar which is how I got to know um, uh, Winston and, and a variety of, of, of other scholars that I've been 
working with in various ways since then. Um, we have to have dialogue. We have to, to reach across disciplines and we have to ask these questions. We, we have to be uncomfortable with our inability to answer them. Um, and I have foraged um, over the last, well, it's, it's been going on for really about 20 years of foraging in different disciplines to see which ones could help me sometimes answer questions, but somehow ask the questions that needed to be asked. And um, uh, work that I did reading around in, in medical anthropology, uh, starting about 20, uh, more than 20 years ago, um, has been incredibly fruitful. Global health, the, all the work that I'm doing on plague and leprosy, I put into the context of global health, of how did these diseases become pandemic? How did they come to affect every human population um, in the world? And I think there are tremendous ways that now we are in a position to start contributing back to these other disciplines, that we see the long perspective, um, that we see the long um, trajectories. It's not simply um, you know, seeing, okay, the parallels of xenophobia, um, uh, for example. Those are, um, those are complex issues um, uh, in, in and of themselves, and I don't wanna suggest that there's a simple linear narrative that uh, explains any of that. But the larger ways in which humans create the situations that allow infectious disease, um, diseases to flourish, those are some of the things that, that we need to be um, looking at. And I think that we are doing phenomenal work pioneering what interdisciplinary work and interdisciplinary dialogue um, looks like. I mean, the, the, again, the ease of pulling this together was because of years of finding people, reading their stuff, communicating with them. You know, for, for, for every person I can invite to a panel, there's maybe a hundred emails um, that um, preceded that in terms of, of, of getting to know them and, and, and showing them that I, that I respect them and, 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 and have trust in the value of their work. Um, so, and, and the thing is, is that everything that, that, that all of us are doing now in this, this present moment, we were also doing in January. We could have had this seminar. We could have been contributing to, to broader discussions about COVID-19 um, uh, right from the start. Um, but there seems to have been a general um, uh, assumption that why bother? You know, how, how, how could the medieval past possibly be relevant. So that would be kind of the flip side of what um, Matt was saying about easy assumptions about what the, the, the Middle Ages is. I think those of us who are in a position to know what the Middle Ages is and how complicated it was and how interconnected it was, I think that we have um, the opportunity and increasingly um, the moral support from each other to speak up um, to, to, to put forward some uh, suggestions. And, and, and I have a, a, a piece that, that, that will be coming out soon. Um, it's called Emerging Diseases, Reemerging Histories. And the concept of emerging diseases is basically, um, it, it, it crystallized in the 1990s in response to Ebola, in response to HIV AIDS, of wait a minute, our problems with, with infectious diseases aren't simply the diseases we already know about. You know, the tuberculosis, the diphtheria, the typhoid, um, and so forth. There might be new diseases that come into the world. How do we deal with them? How do we um, prevent their, um, their transmission? Um, and we had a, um, we, the, the, the world, had a very scary um, case with SARS um, in, in, in 2003. So this, this idea of emerging infectious diseases, and you know, there's a journal um, with the same name, and it's, it's essentially a subdiscipline, has been, been very valuable to me in stimulating my thinking of seeing, yes, the black dust was an emerging infectious disease um, in the 13th century, even if um, 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 Islamic society in particular remembered the experience of plague, because Islam emerges in the context of the Justinianic plague. There are traditions of talking about it. There's a vocabulary to talk about it. 
Um, and I think that, that, that um, our ability to go back as historians and see humankind's repeated challenges of dealing with emerging infectious diseases and dealing with, with, with new situations, um, I think we, uh, we actually have a lot um, to say. And one of the things I was actually, I, I was surprised that it came out this way when I was writing this, this, this essay of thinking of are the diseases that we have that are globally distributed like tuberculosis, like leprosy, are those the, the, the remaining echoes of previous pandemics that we just, we just decided we're going to live with them? Um, and is that what we're facing right now with COVID-19? Is that we say, okay, well, um, you know, we'll protect certain populations and then let, let, let other populations fend for themselves. These are all very big and very, very huge questions that I think we need to be wrestling with right now. I think I, I have someone at the door, which yeah. might be my Mother's Day flowers oh, <laughs> that are several days late, as you can tell. So I'm going to run to the door. So okay. you, can, you can start your wrap up. Sure thing. OK. <laughs> Thanks so much, Monica, um, for helping us think about what pre-modern uh, scholars can offer to our current perspective on COVID-19 and other re-emerging diseases, but also how uh, we medievalists and pre-modern scholars can use modern tools and modern perspectives to transform our field. I uh, wanted to thank all of the speakers uh, for the great presentations. Thank uh, Lisa Fagan Davis and the Medieval Academy. Oh, beautiful flowers are here. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, Medieval Academy for hosting and sponsoring this webinar. Uh, also, uh, another acknowledgement to Lori Yoris and uh, Christopher Cole of the Medieval Academy Off Scenes uh, for helping with this. Uh, Lisa, did you want to say anything more? Nope, she's shaking her head no. <laughs> okay, and uh, thank you to all of uh, you dedicated uh, attendees uh, for sticking with us uh, for the full two and a half hours and especially for your amazing questions uh, through Twitter and email. Sorry that we didn't get to everything, but had a great uh, collection uh, that addressed all of our speakers. So thanks to everybody. Stay safe. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. And the, the session has been recorded and that will be available in the coming days. So we'll be sure to pr publicize the link once it's been put online. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank and you. thank you, Monica. Thank all of you. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you for you. coming. Thank be you. Well. Bye. Thank you. Uh,